The following program does not have a normal intro because I was really too busy smoothing other things over to get it done. So, Corey? Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the following program. I'm your host, Joe Nierman, a.k.a. Good Logic. I need to start with one thing out of the gate. There's one thing I got to get out, out, out of the gate. There is... I am not alone in this. I am sure I am not alone in this. Like, I'm positive. I cannot be the only one. I cannot be the only one. That I just want to acknowledge and say, there's nothing more awesome as a podcaster to come into a stream and see, like, a super chat or something, or something to that effect, which happens to me occasionally, not really that often. But it's like, you just feel good, like, all right, let's go, let's go, let's go. But even, even beyond that, I have to say, I'm, I'm gonna. I have to say, walking into some to to whims gifting five memberships to the following. I'm giving you for that. I'm giving. I'm giving one of these. Now I know you didn't hear that because I'm a boomer. <laughs> but what you would have heard if you were sitting in my chair with my headphones on, which no one else on the planet heard, was uh, was uh, I gave you the I gave you the horn. You might be saying, Joe, which horn did you give Wims there? Which one did you give her? Well, I'll tell you right now. It was one of these. God bless you. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Wims. And, um, yeah, you're awesome. Okay. So, got that out of the way. Got that out of the way. Now that you all heard it. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You might have seen when I pulled open my screen there, when I pulled my screen open there, that much as I usually do, I usually start with like a, a quick thing. And I want you to know something. This is a video that was shared with me on Locals. I usually start with like a quick thing that lasts like five minutes. And I'm going to make this last only only like five minutes, even though, and I've watched the first minute and a half of it. And I was like, man, I could spend like 45 minutes on this, but I'm not going to, because I do want to go through the Cash Patel. I do want to go through the Cash Patel cross-examination because i thought the way he handled himself the every every part of it there was so much brilliance it teaches there's so many lessons that we can learn from it not simply how to conduct yourself as a witness which you should learn that lesson but actually how to conduct yourself in general this is I, i'm telling you right the more I, I i i was just this is a clinic this is a clinic and it's it's a good lesson for men it's a good lesson for women it's a good lesson for all of us the way he conducted himself. So many things about the way he conducted himself were just chef's kiss. That like I I was I was I'm I'm when I'm watching, I'm like, I wonder if I could do it that well. I'd like to think I could, but man, my God. Oh, amazing. All right. But before we get to that, let me just let me just share this with you. Because apparently this was shared in my locals. And this is sad. This is just a sad, sad, sad. I could spend forever on this video that I'm about to show you. I could spend forever on this video. Forever. I could probably, I could probably talk about this for hours. Good morning. <laughs> My guy. So let's talk about where the word good morning originated from. Good morning. All right, so during slavery times, when the women used to mourn about their child being taken away what? and sold to a different slave master, what? or if one of the family members did something what? that resulted into them getting whipped or killed, oh no! Most of these things used to happen in the evening time. Oh my God! No, 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 no! It cannot be. You're telling me that 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 everything that I've believed in all these all these all these years that I've callously been just saying good morning i've been like subtly embracing the patriarchy and white man's servitude so sub subjecting minorities to oppression say it ain't so say it ain't so when a child was sold off or somebody was getting whipped for something always at night they sold off a child the children are always sold at night everyone knows this child sold off whipping that all happened at night and i want to make clear here before we go any further I'm not apologize. I'm not trying to be. I'm not gonna apologize or say that there was anything remotely positive about slavery because it sucked. It was terrible. It was very, very oppressive. So before you, before before anyone's anyone's shorts get in a bunch, 
I'm just going to make that statement crystal clear. I'm just dissecting. I'm dissecting. Dissecting because that's what I do. My brain works like this. My brain works. It's like, is this really true? Is this really, really true? <laughs> the black women used to cry all night behind it. That's Not most, even just yeah. the women. The black people in general. All the black slaves, male that. or female. That's, I, when something happened to a family member or a close friend or anything, they used to cry all night behind it. And when the slaves used to cry about what happened all night long, the white slave masters, the oppressors, will wake up in the morning time and they'll tell the slaves, did you have a good morning? Basically, did you have a good cry out? <laughs> I don't think this is true. I don't think this is true. I don't think this is really that accurate. Did you do enough crying last night because of what happened to their family member a day prior? So the white oppressors came up with good morning as a mockery towards black people mm. during the slavery times mm. when they used to cry and mourn and grieve mm. over what happened to somebody when they was whipped or you see you didn't know this you didn't know this this is like a life lesson for you killed or taken off to another plantation so it was their way to make fun of the black slaves crying that night prior so this this, this woman really believes it this is I, I haven't I haven't seen anyone this dead serious in the way they were telling a message over since I watched Shabazz Kane Martin. <laughs> this this is this is since I've seen Shabazz Kane Martin, and you either know the reference or you don't. <laughs> this is Shabazz Kane Martin. So they were asked him, "Did you have a good morning? Did you, <laughs> did you have a good cry?" And they will laugh about it. Mm. I, I imagine, I imagine that 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 you know, they, I don't know how how big a laugh about that. I mean, the joke the joke probably got old after a while. You would think. So that was their way of being funny towards the black slaves. What did black slaves say to each other? What what did they, what did they say to each other? I, I'm, I'm just. What did they say? Instead of that, because they wouldn't be mocking each other, what would they? What would they likely have said? Said when they would cry all night about somebody that was hung, somebody that was killed. That was their way to make fun of them. Y'all know what mourning mean? All they did was take the U off of it. All they did, you see, it was that easy. That's what made it. That's what was the. That was the brilliance and the simplicity that you. All you have to do. Look, they were like, "What should we say?" And first thing in the morning when we see someone, I know, <laughs> we just take the U off. What does she think they called? What did they call that part of the day before? Before they before they came up with this this artsy way of mocking people, what did they? What does she? Th <laughs> wow! So nobody would think about what it really originated from. Mm. It was really a mockery towards black slaves. Thanks, princess. And them making fun of what they did to their people when someone was hung, killed, or sold off to a different plantation. I hope there's a lesson so that, that comes out of all this. Oh, wait, uh, what is this? That was their way of being funny. Oh, you can even see, because the truth is, I didn't even realize this, that the word mourning is spelled M-O-U-R-N-I-N-I-N-I-N-G, which which sounds like mourning. Like, I, I never even, that never even dawned on me. Now it's like a bright light that's suddenly shining on my face. <laughs> I'm suddenly awake with this bright light shining on my face. <laughs> I was in the dark. I was in the dark, and all of a sudden, like this beacon shining down on me out of nowhere, like from the sky, just coming over the horizon. And all of a sudden, now I'm wide awake. I can smell the coffee, fresh roast coffee. Just ah, uh, I never even realized that that was that's what the word you probably didn't know what the word morning that there was a word morning like that. You probably didn't. She's 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 bringing this to you. 
Did you have a good morning? Did you have a good cry about that person's death? She's saying this a lot. I'm feeling like there's a little bit. You could have. You probably could have edited some of this. Did you have a good cry about your daughter being taken away from you and sold off somewhere else? Mm -hmm. Did you have a good cry of your brother being hung yesterday? That was their way of being funny. Good morning, everyone. You you didn't know this. You were living in darkness. Now you have been awakened. You have been awakened. I say to you, good morning. <laughs> good morning. Wow. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Wow. Unbelievable. That's unbelievable. That's that's I thought you might need to have that life lesson. You might need to have that that life lesson. But if you are wondering, if you are wondering, the, the phrase good morning comes from uh, Guten Morgen. It was German. And basically, people are unsure whether they've been saying it for like a thousand years or 1400 years is how long they've been saying good morning. Good morning. Good morning. But uh, which got and then became good morning. But yeah. All right. Look. Kids stay in school. Stay in school. That's what that's the that's the message here. Stay in school. All right. All right. With that out of the way now, I got a couple of you in here. You probably want me to start going through this thing. I'm just gonna go through this quick. I don't know if you know Cash is a former prosecutor and public defender. He is based. Oh, I I I know. I, I know. And by the way, I really did always think he was the guy from Parks and Recreation for like the longest time. For like the longest time. I thought he was the guy from Parks and Recreation. Uh Jenny L. Thank you. Thank you so much for the uh, the super chat. I really appreciate that. How much more racist is good evening? Shame on you, joke. One can only wonder. One can only wonder. Can we please use this as an excuse to be racist just this one time? <laughs> oh, no. What do you do? Good night, me. You can't even begin to wonder. The Egyptians tell the Jews good middle day, apparently. Apparently. Who knows? Who knows? All right. All right. I really did think he was from Parks and Recreation. Is that racist of me? Because tell me he doesn't look like him. I'm going to look, look this up. IMDB. What's the guy's name? It's gonna bother me. Browse. I don't want to browse episodes. I don't want to watch an upload. I just want to see the actors. I just want to see. Why are you not? Why are you being difficult? Why can't people just be Parks and Recreation episode guy? Just give me like a cast, cast and crew. What's his name? What's his name? Is it Tristan Shapiro? No, that's not it. No, what series right to right? Let's see. Just give me your actors. Aziz Ansari, that's it. I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. That, I'm not crazy. I'm I'm not crazy. That's really not. That's not crazy. It's not. I'm sorry. I I don't even feel bad about this one. I don't feel bad about it. The shape of the eyes, everything, the height, everything. Everything. This is not my fault. This is not my fault. And I didn't mean it. I didn't even think it was funny. I was just like, oh, wow, that guy got into politics. Anyway, well, I may have been mistaken about that. Fortunately, I never told anyone, so no one can actually prove that I really believe that. All right. With that being said, let's get started. Let's get started watching Cash Patel. Oh, my God. Dude was genius. Genius. Brilliant. Uh, I don't know if I'm gonna find it anywhere but my own channel, so I'm gonna just gonna go there. And we're gonna watch me watching me. It's gonna feel like inception for you, but that's the way it's gonna be. Yeah, I'm not recording it either. The good news is that since since Nick isn't streaming tonight, I really can go as long as I need to. All right. Should I follow a video where she got where she got her info? Oh, okay. It's Germany. What did they do to Jewish people? I don't think they did anything. They're like. Everyone knows Germans can never be racist. Till the all of humanity are racist in the morning. 
Is that double speak? No, I think it's front and back speak, according to Dr. Peter Simi. Cash Patel flushed the petitioner's lawyer. Didn't just flush him. It's the voice. The voice also. Everything. 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 I'm not. I know you all thought the same thing for the longest time. I'm not. I'm definitely not the only person who thought this. I'm definitely not the only person who thought this. I'm sure a lot of you. I'm sure a lot of you. You, you don't have to admit it. I'm, I can be man enough to admit it. All right. Let's get started here. We're, I'm going to jump ahead. Let me that. This is me watching me. Me watching me. For you, this is like Inception. For me, it's just me watching me. This is me waiting for the judge to show up. Because I was so early and on time. Oh, wait. This is not still waiting. Is she there yet? Oh, wait, what's going on? Have like, you can't be violating in, people in, in the 1800s being disqualified for writing a, a letter to the editor. Oh, this is oh, she started she started the afternoon session today. She started that by basically explaining why it was that she was denying the motion for a directed verdict. That's what I'd forgotten. I was just let's see. Where's cash? Where's Cash? There he is. As an assistant federal public defender um, for the Southern District of Florida. And thereafter, I transitioned to the Department of Justice's National Security Division. So this is the this is where he's um this is where he's he's doing direct. How long Oversight is the direct? operations and also serve as How the lead chief investigative counsel. For the investigation into Russia. So I want to do his director or not. No, they don't. They don't. They they really, really, really do not. He just happens to look like Aziz Ansari. I'm sorry. <laughs> Aziz, I'm sorry. I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start this cross. Let's start this cross. President Trump brought up. Uh, the possibility of utilizing National Guard forces for the upcoming voting uh, confirmation process. And that bullet point refers to his authorization, which we captured in this timeline. And the purpose was the purpose of that to uh, support local authorities and law enforcement. So, OK, let me give you some backdrop here. Some of you might be new. So let me just explain to you. This is a trial that I was watching this afternoon. In case you're confused, in case you're confused, this is a trial I was watching this afternoon where six petitioners are suing the secretary of state for the state of Colorado, looking to have Trump disqualified and taken off of the ballot on the basis of his purportedly having incited insurrection on January 6th. And the case and the petitioners finished their case in chief. And the first witness out of the gate for the de for the defense was Cash Patel. Cash Patel is a former White House advisor. On the date in question, January 6, 2021, he was like second in charge for overseeing the defense of this. Under under the, uh, he he responded. He was answering to Chris Miller, who was in charge of of everything, and he was beneath Chris Miller. Was supposed to oversee the defense and of the interior not armed forces but the interior and that he was he was directly beneath him he spent a great deal of time on direct here walking through all the steps that trump who according to the petitioners was looking to incite an insurrection and to overtake the capital so he spent considerable time going through memorandum that were created over during the days leading up to January 6th and on January 6th, documenting the different meetings and, and conversations and who attended these meetings and who was there when they when they walked through when when they were basically setting up how we recognize there's gonna be a lot of folks who are gonna be coming down here for this for this rally and the, and the speech at the ellipse. And there's a lot of them gonna be riled up. What sort of defensive measures should we take? And that he had, had a meeting, which he points to on January 3rd, and this date becomes important, Sunday, January 3rd, 2021, three days before the siege of the Capitol, where he said that he met with acting Secretary of Defense, and which is Chris Miller, and and the CGSCS met with the president. The president occurs an activation of the DC National Guard, DCNG, the DC National Guard. So what do they say? They say, we're going to activate 
the DC, we're happy, we're okay with activating the DC National Guard. I think we probably need to hear some of his testimony in order to understand the distinction in these different levels. So the first, first you have to authorize. <coughs> You have to authorize the, the National Guard to be released, and then they ultimately have to be activated. So he said they were totally comfortable with him being activated. We'll, we'll, we'll let him, I'll let him do his thing. I'll let him do his thing. The purpose of National Guard has always <laughs> been, my understanding, is to support local law enforcement when a request is made. Oh, you see? Okay. I'm so – thank you, Sam. Until five minutes ago, my girlfriend seriously thought the same. Lash was from Parks and Recreation. She's so embarrassed, more embarrassed. I'm super chatting <laughs> You should not be embarrassed. This is a public service message. Cash Patel is not Aziz Ansari. And yes, they look like twins. Everyone knows this. I don't even know if they're the same race. One might be one might be in, from, from Pakistan. One might be from India. One might be from South America. I don't know. I don't know. I don't care. I'm simply saying those two gentlemen looked exactly the same. Wow, that's very thoughtful. Thank you, Mo. You're, you're, you're flattering. I told chat if they become a high priest, they discover the truth about Jew money. <laughs> I said, my disciple, even I know about the secret Kool-Aid stash. And it's true. She a disciple. Worcestershire sauce, a disciple. Just me. If you're crazy, I'm insane. It's just me realizing it was two different people. It's, I'm, I'm so happy. Oh, my God. Finally, the world is admitting it. I thought he just got political during Trump's administration. Same thing. I thought the same thing. He even sounds like him to me. And funny, during interviews, there's so much similarity here. It's not your bad. And you know what? I blame Cash. He should have, the first thing he should have said is, by the way, I am not Aziz Ansari. That's the first thing he should have said. Like in every time he goes anywhere, that's the first thing he should say in any meeting. Um, by the way, he should, I, I'm angry at him. He didn't say the start of this deposition. Thank you for all your work. You're very welcome, Rock. You're very welcome. And I appreciate that you put two words there, not in all caps. That's very... I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> I like you, Rock. You're funny. Through their chain of command, which would be the governor or the mayor, since it's Washington, D.C., or the Capitol Police Chief, since we're talking about the Washington, uh, the Capitol building. Nancy Pelosi or Muriel Bowser. DC. So what he's saying is this. That yes, Trump oversees the entire National Guard. He's in charge of. He's the only one who can activate them. However, in, in order for them to be discharged and actually put into the field, he requires approval from the local governing authorities. I'm not sure if he said it already in this testimony or afterwards, but he said, you know, as it was started as like um, um for 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 unarmed citizens initially they thought it would be dangerous unless they actually worked out with the local authorities who's coming in and 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 that they're they have the authority because otherwise it would be dangerous that all of a sudden you have this militia marching in there and they could basically start clashing with local authorities who don't recognize the authority of each other so this is why you need to be on the same page you can't think to yourself in let's think in in 2020 terms national guard has been around for a century and the idea is you have to have coordination with local authorities which means you need to have approval with local authorities so that so that both on a legal grounds and a juris and, and as well as on a practical grounds you need the approval from the local authority say so that he'll notify his local authorities and say hey look the national guard's coming in here don't freak out when you see a whole bunch of armed men coming in here okay now um I'd like to show you Exhibit 1031, which has also been previously admitted. And he also said that because Washington, D.C. is unique, it's not state or it's not there's no state that is governing it. So you, the only person has authority normally, I think he said, is the governor. The only person who could authorize that is the mayor of D.C., which is Muriel Bowser at the time. Or when it, And he said when it comes to the capital, the, because the capital is, is, is under – the jurisdiction of the Speaker of the House, you require Nancy Pelosi's authority because she has her local police there, the Capitol Guards. You can't just send in national, you can the National Guard when there are Capitol Guards because they might clash with each other. And they can't send them into Washington D.C. because they might they might clash with Metro D.C. So these are the reasons why you need to have the authority. Debbie. Off topic, Representative Luna was quoted as saying they'll be ready to impeach FJB at the beginning of 2024. What's the benefit of the timing versus now? It makes no sense to me, even with election timing. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the upside is at all. 
I try to think of what the upside is, but I don't know. I guess it takes a while to do it properly. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, so, Jan, Jan, if you could put that up. And let's start with the cover page. Um, I'm going to run through this direct. Sir, do you recognize this as the. I want to run through the direct a little bit faster because to me, A, I heard it. Uh, sometime before and B um, because that's not really as entertaining. We need the information. You need the information that he says so that we can understand it, but we don't need to have him. You don't need to have it. Let's see if we go one and a half. And if I put closed captions on maybe one and a half, can I get closed captions? You're going to give me closed captions. You're not giving me closed captions. Really? I can't get closed captions on my own damn thing. What's annotations? What is annotations? I don't know what that means. All right, let's go. Um, November 16th, 2021 report of the Department of Defense Inspector General fast. regarding his That's review of the Department of Defense's role, responsibilities, and actions to prepare for and respond to the protests in its aftermath at the U.S. Capitol campus on January 6th, 2021. I do. Okay. And uh, since it was prepared November 16th, 2021, that would have been during the Biden administration, correct? That is correct. Were you interviewed for that report? I was not. All right. Um, Joanna, if you could put up page 15 now, please. Notice they have like this whole review of what the role is to respond for protest that this is an aftermath of U.S. Capitol campus on January 6th. Um, it's actually the numbered page 15, so it may be different than the 15 document. There you go. Thank you. Um, so let me direct your attention to table one, which starts on page 15. And then we'll carry on to page 16, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, do you recognize that as a chronology of significant events leading up to January 6th? I'm do it like this. Yes, yeah, in general. You, I want you to be able to see it. Uh, and let me direct your attention. The reason, the to reason the I position entry. myself in the upper corner instead of the way I'm positioned right now on your camera is because whenever a document comes up, I want my audience to be able to see it. And if I'm... Oh, I can block myself. Oh, this is so much better. This is genius. I'm blocking myself this way. <laughs> For December 31st, 2020. Do you see that entry? Yep, I got it. Okay, does it discuss a DC RFA to the DCNG for January 5th through 6th, 2021 for, and I'm paraphrasing, traffic control and crowd control at metro stations and response capability? Yes, I see that. That's what's reflected there. Could you please explain what you understand that entry to mean? An RFA is a request for assistance, which is the formal verbiage when a appropriate level officer or secretary submits a request for National Guard assistance. And as is documented here, that RFA went specifically to the Washington, D.C. National Guard for the very specific duties of performing traffic control at intersections. So they're looking over here down at the, at December 31st, where the, the DCH SAMA director submits the DCA or RFA a request for assistance to the to the to national guard for january 5th and 6 2021 for traffic control and intersections crowd control at metro station platforms and cbrn response capability mg walker informs mr mccarthy of the dc of the dc rfa meaning that they went to D district to dc and they said we we want your authorization to bring them to bring us in here we're not waiting for you to ask for it we want to offer that hey we'll send in the national guard for you on january 5th and 6th and crowd control at metro stations. When the requests for National Guard are provided, they are also, as is notified here, um, granted with specificity as to what they're requesting, not just generally people. And that's encapsulated by this bullet point here. And M.G. Walker at the time was Major General Walker, the head of the Washington, D.C. National Guard. Mr. McCarthy was the Secretary of the Army at the time. The Secretary of the Army controls the entire National Guard org structure for the United States of America. And this this RFA or request for assistance that was that coming from the DC local government? Yeah, I, that's what all those letters stand for. Um, and uh, so, if I understand that correctly, um, the DC local government was requesting a limited number of DC National Guard members. Um, is your recollection about three hundred and forty? Is that is that right? Specifically, it was three hundred and forty-six. The request came in through Mayor Bowser's office, who's Mayor of Washington, D.C. at the time. 
And the specific request was not just with numbers, but what their assistance was to be utilized for, which was our practice when receiving a request. We needed to know how to arm, kit, and man our troops. And in this instance, they would not be armed. If I recall correctly, they would be wearing the bright yellow vest and assisting in traffic duties and possibly wearing protective gear, but that would be about it from my recollection. Now, if you could switch to page 16, Joanna. And I would direct your attention to the second entry for January 3rd, 2021. State Appellate Court's first yeah. item. And that entry reads, Not straight to Mr. Miller. Okay, now what I realize is this. When you're seeing this, I see myself in in old time and you don't see me because I'm sort of blocking me. In other words, <laughs> if I put myself down here, you would see that's what I that's what it looks like to me. But when I put myself up here, this is this is really this is really meta. When, <laughs> when I put myself up here, I end up blocking it. So then I hear my voice, but you don't see my my lips moving, which might be a little disconcerting for you. I wonder when I open up a super chat here, just me. That's going to end up blocking the other super chat. This is a current super chat. It says, read the part on who runs D.C. The words are clear. It's administration of the district. is a federal government in the Constitution, not Congress, not court administration. It's the president just saying, okay, all right. Uh, well, you and, you and Bill Banks are on the same page. Even if it's their authorization, at the end of the day, this is the way it's done. There's, there's a difference, and this is one of the things I learned and that applies to being a lawyer. And there's, there's a difference between the way things are done and what the official rules are as to like, you know, do you have, does he have to give the courtesy to them? I don't know. Maybe he didn't have to give that courtesy, but if it's done that way for that, that's how it's always done. That's what you're going to do. And to say, well, why did you do it that way? Well, that's the way it's always done. So what do you, what are you asking me that question for? I'll tell you right now. Okay. I'll give you an example of this as, as a litigator. Okay. <clears throat> When you're a litigator, you make a scheduling order for when discoveries, how discoveries are being handled. You do that preliminary conference. You basically set up, okay, this is when I'll give you the documents and within the next 30 days. And 30 days after that, you'll get documents back to me. And 60 days later, we'll have depositions. You put down a firm date because you're, you're doing it on, on January 27th. And you put down 30 days later and 30 days later and then 60 days later. And you basically mark up your calendar so that the depositions are going to happen on or before August 1st. <clears throat> Now, so now you know <clears throat> that the look, you were supposed to depose the other side on August 1st. Expected, expected common practice in New York is that you will call your adversary the day before or the business day before and confirm that their client will be there on August 1st. That is a common practice. Is it something you're required to do? Probably not. But that's just the way things are done. It's, a, it's something that's, that's established that things are done. To not do it would be like a weird thing and, and, and perhaps considered like a like that would weaken my ability to hell to, to hold the other side in, in some in, 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 as, as, be, as doing anything wrong. If anything, I'm the one who's considered to do something wrong, even though there's a court order signed off by a judge saying that he's going to appear. If I don't take that step, which isn't written anywhere in the order, there's nowhere in there, in there that's requirement that I that says it's a requirement I call. No one ever writes that you'll call 24 hours before, but that's what's always done. And it's so accepted that that's just what that even if I go to court, and I, if I if I show up on on August first and I'm like, where's your client? You're like, and then he says, well, you didn't call me yesterday and confirm that he's coming here. I didn't think I didn't know if you were coming or not. And then I say, you know what? I want to move to have your your pleading struck because you failed to do it. And I try bringing a motion saying, hey, they didn't show up. The court order, the signed by the judge, said they're going to show up. You know what the judge is going to say to me? Did you call? And I'll be like, no. Well, why didn't you call? I, I didn't say anywhere in the order I had to call. Once you're doing it long enough, you know, this is what's accepted practice. And it's so accepted, there's no chance in hell I would ever get any sort of relief if I didn't follow that common practice. So, too, if, a if, if it is accepted practice that, that Donald Trump is not sending troops in anywhere unless he gets approval from the local authorities, even if he technically has the authority or license to do so, if he were to breach that norm and, God forbid, someone got hurt, the entire left would be screaming, you've breached norms, and that's why someone died. That's why, imagine if there was some God forbid massacre there. Imagine if, he, if, if they're not approved by Nancy Pelosi, and you end up having a firefight between National Guards and, and, the, capital, and, the, and the Capitol Police. 
or the or DC Metro because they think it's you know some sort of person who's fake because there's no authority here. We didn't give you that authority. It creates a dangerous situation. It could create them squaring off against each other with civilians in the middle. It's actually like it's kind of insane to send them in without their approval when that is what is accepted practice. So I'm not so what I'm saying to you is this just me. I don't I'm not refuting that and saying that you're technically inaccurate. I don't know. I haven't looked into this. It's very it's very possible. Bill Banks, who is an expert on this, he's the one who said in an emergency situation that Trump has the, that can override the uh, Nancy Pelosi and Muriel Bowser. He's the president. And that's probably technically true. It also is probably stupid. It's probably dangerous. It's probably leads to lethal outcomes for people who have no expectation that all of a sudden the National Guard is coming in there despite, despite a failure to follow normal standard protocol procedure. So you're probably correct. You're probably correct. And yet that would not have likely made the situation better if anything likely would have made it worse. The chances are exceedingly high. And if it had made things worse, the only the person who's primarily to blame in that situation would be Trump because he's not, he's failing to follow protocols, established practice. And General Milley attend a White House meeting. Yeah. At the end of the meeting, the president asks about election protest preparations, and Mr. Miller tells him, <laughs> quotes, we've got a plan. And you're correct and about this, Chattel, by the way. To be fair, the left crying schemes, no matter what happens, you're right, they do. But all the more so if you actually fail to follow procedure, right? If you're following procedure, you can always say, look, this is the way it's done. This is how it happens. This is how it's supposed to be. So all the more so if you breach from procedure, right? I mean, then this then it sounds like there's more justification because like, why'd you breach from procedure? And you decide to breach from procedure and now someone's dead because of it. Rather than you didn't do anything because you were following procedure. Do you see that? Yes, sir. Do you understand that to be the same January 3rd meeting discussed in the Department of Defense timeline we reviewed a few minutes ago? It's one and the same. And did you attend that meeting? I did. Okay. Um, you, did you attend in your capacity as the acting secretary's chief of staff? I did. Was it common practice for you to attend meetings at the White House when the acting secretary attended? Almost everyone. Do you remember where that meeting took place? In the Oval Office. Uh, can you tell us what was discussed at that meeting? Uh, mostly no, because it was involving a matter of national security that I'm not at liberty to discuss here, but it had nothing to do with these events. Um, and then at the back end, as this timeline notates, there was a discussion briefly about uh, National Guard forces and the upcoming uh, protests. Um, and Stephen, so uh, according to the timeline we just looked at, um, by the way, guys, I'd bring you in here, but I, I'm, this will take four hours if I have any if I have a guest join me. But let's see, you, brother. The uh, acting secretary told the president, "We've got a plan, and we've got it covered." Was there any other or any further detail discussed at that meeting? Yeah, I don't remember exactly uh, the verbiage, but having as you walk through prior to January third, specifically on December thirtieth and thirty first, request for National Guard coming in. Our practice under the law, as we understood it, was we needed presidential authorizations for it. During this conversation, the president authorized 10 to 20,000 National Guardsmen and women to be utilized, if necessary, around the country to provide assistance to local law enforcement. Now, this is an important thing. He says he talks about authorizing 10 to 20,000 men and women across the country, everywhere. That, that 10 to 20,000. Bill Banks was basically saying all those claims that they had 10, 20,000 is a lie because I know it's a lie because there would have had to be transfer orders for people because the National Guard would have to be utilized from across the country and there would have to be all sorts of, uh, of orders that would be issued to direct people to tr for transport to get here and there's zero evidence that that actually happened. What he's saying is across the country, he's authorizing 20,000 to, 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 um, to go out there. So as of that January 3rd meeting, so they weren't brought down to Washington. The they were just available the board, around the country. DOD, 10, using 20, whatever National Guard oh, that's why the other idiot. It's discretion. Bill, see, I'm consistent. This is me talking. <laughs> I hope this is not confusing to you. I should put myself just down here. I'll put myself down there. There you go. No, he authorized. Thank you. You see, this is me looking at old Joe. This is me looking at, this is me, like, like it's almost like, Past Joe is coming into my present and like some whole sort of space time continuum. So this is past Joe telling me what to say to you in re in current time. 
thinks, didn't know anything about it. He's like, I don't see Sustained. Okay. How did you ask the question again, please? Sure. Um, and and <laughs> Mr. Uh, Patel, <laughs> you need to, before answering, if there's been an objection which you may not have heard, you need to um, let me roll, okay? I'm sorry, ma'am. I didn't hear that. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I think you need to, in order for him to hear your objection, you're going to have to move the speaker over so he can. My opinions. Yeah. But that's why Bill Banks was saying I didn't see any records um, of 20,000 because they're available. They didn't come. They, there was no. Did you have any doubt? Have, I should just sit here quietly. <laughs> I shouldn't say anything. To bring that to you Washington, left that January 3rd the meeting. They didn't that the president was on board with DOD using whatever National Guard resources were needed. Trust me, I'm going to add a lot more as current Joe than I did as, as old Joe because there's, there's different points I want to make in this than, than I could make in real time. In its discretion. Objection. Leading. Sustained. Try again. At the conclusion of that January 3rd meeting, what was your impression of the president's position on the use of the National Guard? We had all Objection. the- Objection calls for speculation as to the president's intent. He can, he can, uh, <clears throat> he can respond to the extent he had an impression. See, that's me, that's me predicting what the judge says. <laughs> uh, my understanding from that meeting was that the president had authorized the National Guard troops we needed and under the laws, we understood it for National Guard purposes, we had step one of a two-step process. And so we had everything we needed, because this is what we do all the time, to go execute step two of the plan while leaving, which is why Secretary of Defense Chris Miller said, uh, we've got a plan and we've got it covered. That's what we do. We do reps and sets. To your knowledge oh, by the way, this is a great point, which is if Trump did pre-order and deploy the National Guard, that would have looked like it's a little it's a military takeover. Like he took the National Guard and the reason National Guard is going in there is because they basically want to like like arrest Congress. That's what that's the other way we've been played. That Trump is a crazy person. We told you he wouldn't leave the White House. He's unleashing the National Guard on the Capitol because he's trying to take over Congress. That's how it would have been spun. Did that's what Nancy didn't give this authority. Why is he doing it? Anyone at DOD over the coming days, or certainly, oh, let me strike that. To your knowledge, did anyone in DOD leadership Great over the coming out. days ever suggest that more or different authority was needed from President Trump in order to utilize the National Guard troops? Objection lacks foundation. I asked about his knowledge, Your Honor. Overruled. You can answer if you have an answer. Under our practice, we would consult with the well, Office of the General Counsel of the Department of Defense, along with the White House Counsel's Office, for any legal requirements we might need. But from my perspective um, and my <coughs> conversations with the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman and the Secretary of the Army, we had what we needed to initiate under the law uh, the first in the 0, 1, 2, 3 phases, as we call them, for the employment, deployment, and activation of the National Guard. Um, at that meeting, did you understand President Trump to have limited DOD's authority to deploy National Guard troops? in support of the civil um, authorities in any way? No, just that the number was 10 to 20,000. So if by chance we needed more, we would have gone back to the commander in chief. Let's go back to exhibit 1031, page 16, which I think we were already on. Um, and let me direct you to the third entry from the bottom. This is not Scott Gessler uh, who's doing the questioning. January 5th, much 2021. Option. I'm sorry. I get frustrated by this lawyer. I get so frustrated okay. by him. January 5th, 2021. During the evening, the president calls Mr. Miller to discuss the upcoming rallies. Mr. Miller told us that the president told him to, quotes, do what's required to protect the American people. Did you, do you understand that to be referring to deploying National Guard troops? Yes. Was there anything else you can think of that might have been referring to? No, because uh, Secretary of Defense Chris, Christopher Miller and I spoke about that conversation, and we... Here, sir. Sustained. When you and Secretary Miller <laughs> spoke about that conversation, was it in order to take a course of action? We didn't. He was waiting to see if there was an objection. <laughs> He's like, you know, okay. Need to take a further course of action. We had already implemented our processes under the president's authorization under the law as we operated. Uh, so this was just a, a another um, presidential statement, but we didn't need it. Um, we had what we needed. Were detailed operational plans for deployment of the National Guard discussed with the president? No, that's I can't think of a, a time where we ever would do that. Why not? 
while the president is the commander in chief of the armed forces, the duties through multiple what we call fragos, fragmentary orders and the like, are delegated down to the SECDEF, which is the National Command Authority, down to further delegations to the Secretary of the Army. The president um, is, we go to the president for authorizations we need and keep him abreast of any issues we think important that rise to his attention. But we have career professionals in place to perform those logistical preparatory <laughs> works, um, such as activating the National Guard, and running through. Uh, Between January 3rd and January 6th, were you personally paying attention to the National Guard issue? Yes. Uh, in what way? Well, as the individual charged with not just being the chief of staff for the Assistant Secretary of Defense, but for the entire Department of Defense um, and his office, I was directly responsible underneath the secretary. Uh, to ensure any orders he gave were followed. And I was in maybe not every single meeting, but probably close to all of them regarding National Guard forces, their employment, deployment, and activation. Did you attend uh, meetings with uh, law enforcement agencies at which the topic was discussed? I think I was at the FBI Washington field office one time with then um, acting, or then, excuse me, then Deputy Director Mark Antuano, if I recall correctly. Were you aware of and following communications with the local authorities about the subject of the National Guard? I only notice now that I yawn like a lion. <laughs> what we did, because the Secretary of the Army is our point person, Secretary McCarthy was a direct liaison in the field with law enforcement and Mayor Bowser's office. That was our established practice. That was the established practice going back to the summer of 2020 specifically and before that. And that was his job. So there was no need for us to directly engage. We had I don't think I'm going to make it that uh, far into this stream. Military personnel and their staffs coordinating directly with local law enforcement. Uh, and so just to close this out, to your knowledge, did any senior DOJ leader ever state in words or substance that they felt they needed more or different authorization from President Trump before they could deploy National Guard troops to keep the peace on January 6th? No. Okay, so... This um, is the first time we're hearing defense, under oath what steps um, Trump took. To protect the capital. Based on what you're telling us, it's pretty true, Joe. felt they had authority to Good use point, National Joe. Guard troops, and I thought it was significant. That's why I mentioned it because I thought it was significant that, like, you're going to see current Joe, like, like pausing the stream because, this is, especially when we get to the cross, because that's where the part I really want to focus on, just what it was about the way he handled himself that was so unique and made his his and basically took the lawyer over his knee. President Trump had been clear that he wanted. <laughs> DOD to do what was necessary to protect the American people. So why didn't we have 10,000 National Guard troops suited up and armed guarding the Capitol on the morning of January 6th? Well, there's a multitude of reasons, but namely under the law as was as the Department of Defense was operating under, pursuant to guidance by the Office of General Counsel and White House Counsel's Office, and Whoa. probably the last hundred years of <laughs> National Guard authorities, step one was a commander in chief's authorization, which we had. Step two was a request by the governing body, the local governing body, That's usually crazy. governor, but in this instance, it's, it's the mayor since it's Washington, D.C., and or the heads of the Capitol Police Bureau, because we're talking about the Capitol building. Absent those requests, we were under the um, advisement of our legal counsel's offices that we could not activate the National Guard. Uh, we could. If we had gone in there, he would have been charged with that. To try to begin the processes of getting these folks so I, I gave myself currently a blue background, so hopefully that'll help distinguish me also a little bit from from daytime Joe. This is nighttime Joe. They uh, ready. In if he had sent people in there, request came in. And what and I mean anyone died? People forget the he National Guard for that. is very part time. We'll be hearing about it every day. Their doctors, their lawyers, their teachers, their husbands, their wives. Having deja vu now in the community. We have to go get them, and if then after approval, the request is made, we can do send that them in? and bring the authorities in that we have in the office of the Secretary of Defense to bear. But absent. The request we could not uh, fully launch that process. Did part of the process involve reaching out to the local authorities to see if they wanted National Guard involvement? Objection leading. And here's another thing: if he sent them in, people would say that, they would, that it was part of the insurrection. Was normally, in, uh, not no. approval. Normally, the request would come in. But in this instance, the secretary and I, along with others, felt this matter was important enough that we ordered the secretary of the Army after that authorization came in on January 3rd to begin engagements with Mayor Bowser and the Capitol Police, who we had already been speaking to on other matters that we've discussed here. And we wanted to make them aware that the president authorized 10 to 20,000 National Guard, and we wanted to ask them if they had a request. It was sort of a, it was a proactive, preemptive measure 
if if they needed it, we could begin that big lift that is moving thousands of human beings across the country. So they didn't actually start moving them because and we never why got is, um, despite offering proactive. What is your understanding of why DOD is um, reluctant to deploy National Guard without um, a request from local authorities? My understanding is historically um, how the department has operated is they do not want to deploy uniformed military officers um, into and around the United States without the appropriate legal authorities because one of the bedrock principles of having a civilian in charge of the military um, <laughs> is that there is no military um, <laughs> sort of hijacking of local governmental offices of power. And uh, I think that's the way, in my understanding, that the Department, Department of Defense has operated its National Guard um, with that history in mind. And if the local authorities explicitly tell DOD that they don't want the National Guard deployed, what would DOD's re reaction be? We, under our, uh, the advice of our general counsel's office, the White House counsel's office, along with other agencies and departments who all agreed that absent a request, we would not move um, the National Guard process forward because we had, or our lawyers had made the determination that based in history and law and precedent, that that would not be an appropriate maneuver for the department to undertake unilaterally. But the Bill Banks said that you could. Bill Banks said it's an emergency and you're allowed to. That's what Bill Banks said. Bill Banks said that. So the Secretary he's, of the Army had reached out to about it for a long time. authorities, um, both in the articles about it. DC government and at the US Capitol. So Bill Banks was the expert witness that I was referencing in my stream earlier today. Bill Banks was the petitioner's expert witness who was coming, who came in and and was explaining what actual protocols and regulations are and why it was that Trump actually had the authority to send the National Guard in. And he spent a long time talking about that. And on cross-examination, he was basically being asked, have you ever had a position where you actually made these decisions? No. Have you ever been... So everything he was talking about was just theoretical. Has anyone actually consulted with you to make these decisions? No. No, never. But he was the, the expert who understands more about National Guard. And that's what I was explaining, the difference between theoretical versus actual. Yeah, theoretically, when I when I have it, when I have a when I have a, a, a preliminary conference order or, or a compliance conference order, the guy's gotta show up at a deposition. But in practicality, that's just not reality unless I unless I take another step of calling his of calling my adversary the day before. That's the difference between how things are officially versus how everyone understands them to be in, in carrying out practice. Police, mm -hmm. uh, what was the response? Uh, I'll paraphrase, but I think the documents have been made public. Mayor Bowser wrote a letter herself, approximately January 4th or 5th, I don't have the exact date, declining further requests for National Guard services outside of the 346 National Guardsmen we had already sent her. And as far as the Capitol Police go, it's encapsulated in multiple people's timelines, including the Chiefs, or excuse me, testimonies from the chiefs of the Capitol Police and the Capitol Police timeline itself, where the sergeant at arms declined the chief of police's request right, for I'll national guard request, here just to and make thus it easier. those two were our answers as we understood it from the two governing authorities. Oh my God! Uh, as far <laughs> as January fifth and into January sixth, from a timeline perspective. Could you put up uh, Exhibit ten twenty eight, please? I think Jesse Benal. And I believe this is another one to which there's been no objection, but I do not believe it's yet been admitted. So I would like to move that this one be admitted if it hasn't yet been. It has been. No objection. Raised. Uh, 1028 is admitted. 1028 is admitted. And Mr. Patel, I would ask you uh, if you recognize this letter. <laughs> I do. And what is it? It's a it's a letter from, excuse me, if you could just scroll down one second. I just want to confirm that the bottom. It's worse. All right. If it's, okay. Thank I'm you. not trying to get worse. It's, a, it's the letter I I'm referenced from better. Mayor Bowser, I believe, on January 5th to the Department of Defense, where she specifically stated we would not be requesting any additional National Guards men and women. And that was her letter to us. So this that is her letter, request. Muriel Bowser. So we were on standby. After she's offered, specifically offered, hey, we're act we activated troops. You want us to deploy them there and help you out? She specifically said no. Um. Did there come a time when the local authorities asked that the National Guard troops be deployed? When you say local authorities, can I just ask for clarification? Do you mean the mayor or or, or, or line level agents? Either. Um, well, um, if that's an important distinction from your perspective, why don't you explain what you mean? Well, sure. We always listen to our operators in the field, our partners in the field here, police officers, 
and both at Metropolitan Police Department, which is DC, and the Capitol Police Department. We've known these folks for a long time, work with them for decades. And so we always have these personal relationships where we're getting our own communications saying, and a lot of those folks said, you know, we would really like National Guard assistance, but there's a chain of command. And as this letter speaks to the top of the chain of command for the mayor, and conversely, uh, the Capitol Police timeline and the chief's testimony speaks for them, there, there was a declination by the, uh, the commanding authorities, respectively, even though the will of the folks doing the work on the ground was slightly different. Okay, well, did there come a time when the commanding authorities for the for DC local government and, and or the Capitol Police um, requested uh, National Guard support? It was on the afternoon of January 6th, and I, I believe- <laughs> I feel like I'm 14. Um, catching up on the live, and just want to say good morning. Weird, my predictive text also took, took away the you. That is weird. Oh, then in good morning. <laughs> timeline, which has some of the delineations. That is weird. Well, let's let's put up that that timeline, and and you can point us to anything on there that you think is is useful. So if you put up page sixteen of whatever that. Well, actually, which, which timeline do, do you want? Do you want the the DOD timeline? Um, there, there's another one with times on it, but I can. Um, I think the D. The, this, guy is, the this attorney is yeah, the so... Sorry. If you just scroll down a little. Scroll down. It's a flagled. <laughs> it's a flagled. <laughs> I'm using Yiddish. Yeah, there you go. Um, so that it's a flagled, the, it's a flagled uh, means scatterbrained. Of course, but some of the highlights that were happening during the day, and you can see specifically um, at 1422, at 222 in the afternoon, the Secretary okay, of the Army um, had a phone call with Mayor Bowser and her deputy mayor and MPD leadership to assess and discuss the current situation on the ground. There was no forthcoming request at that time. Uh, and then Mayor Bowser later in that afternoon would make such a request. And as soon as that request was made, it was relayed back to the Office of Secretary of Defense. But we had already preemptively delegated authorities out to expedite the process. But um, what most people don't understand is we can't just have thousands of men and women ready immediately to deploy there's got to be some place for them to activate. actually be standing so once we got that go we had <laughs> thankfully already staged to the limit of the law where we could and so we probably cut the time down by half and essentially what ended up happening was the fastest cold start of the united states military domestically since world war ii um so Luma, while we always wish to have done it faster the timeline in which we did it was pretty amazing given the, what the men and women had to do on the ground Um, some people now say that the National Guard should have been deployed earlier. Um, was any delay in deploying the National Guard attributable, in your mind, to a need for additional or different authority from President Trump? No. Why not? Well, the president only has a piece of it, and we had that piece. And so, as I said, we we acted on that piece proactively, went to the mayor, went to the Capitol Police. We've discussed this the is not the cross yet. No, um, you know, I wanted I want to have background. First of all, it's hard to find the cross because it's very hard to see who the attorney is that's asking the questions. So it's hard for me to just scroll through it. I also know that the entire thing is only an hour and a half long. So it's like not it's not like it's four hours long. So it's not that long. And second of all, uh, and third and finally, um, I wanted everyone to have context. So when he's answering questions on cross, you can understand basically what he had testified. Get a general idea of what he testified about on direct. Back we did the, the direct. I'm playing at one and a half speed. When I get to the cross, uh, one and a quarter speed, I'll probably slow down to regular time when I get to the uh, cross because I want. I don't. I want to savor it. I think we could. Uh, what do you we, want? We wish we had what gotten a request earlier. And um, you know, fastest like response no time since domestic since World War II. But those authorities, remember, I think it's important to note that the <sighs> the head law enforcement authority of the day was DOJ, not the Department of Defense. It should never be the Department of Defense domestically. And them, along with DHS and the Capitol Police, have measures such as no climb fences Justin's that they could have very installed. Interested. And, you know, I don't know why those questions have to be asked of them. Maybe those motions are a mating ritual. And, and given um, this morning. President Trump's statement to uh, Acting Secretary Miller the evening before that he should do what's required <laughs> to protect so the American funny. people. <laughs> Was there any doubt in your mind about what President Trump wanted? That was a mean joke that I made there. But, like, I don't think anyone but me heard it. <laughs> that was a really mean joke that I made about both the judge and and, and the witness from this morning. Is that done? No. Objection waiting. Sorry. A little late. Sustained. 
Given that statement, were you uncertain about what needed to be done or what <laughs> President Trump wanted done? No, I, I knew exactly what he thought the objection was coming. Was there, to your knowledge, any uncertainty among DOD leadership about objection what the president wanted done? Leading. No. Bad counsel. He got in there. Did anyone in senior DOD objection leadership leading. or anyone at all at, at DOD? That this is what he asks for in, defense. This is one of the, this is the bad attorney for the defense, not not Scott Gessler, uh, who's really good, but this attorney, who's his co-counsel, is really not as good. And every question he asks is leading, and sometimes he gets called on it, sometimes he gets away with it. Convey to the president any request that afternoon for more additional authority or authorization, uh, or say there was a problem that required his attention to get National Guard troops deployed to my knowledge no but we wouldn't have need to have done that we had the 20,000 authorization so anything inside of a numbers count for 20,000 just to give you an example the DC National Guard comprised of 2,500 soldiers give or take 50. so we would bring in the rest from other regions in the country but um, even the amount of soldiers we put into Washington DC it was the largest uniform occupation of DC since the Civil War so I didn't think we were going above 20,000. Did you testify before the January 6th Select Committee? I did. Um, were you questioned in a public hearing? Uh, no, they declined my request for a public hearing. <laughs> this is near the end. Question then? Why? Uh, what we call closed door attorneys, members of the committee, my counsel. That's it. <laughs> Was your testimony? This is near the end. One given? No. When, I say, when I say last in, first out, that's Did you the tell end, them? Right? What you told the us first today about the president and the deployment of National Guard troops? I believe so. Did the committee ever call you to testify about those issues in public session? No. By the way, this is it's it's important to, to, to note that you can see that he's processing the question in his mind. And this is a healthy way for any witness to make sure, and this is something that I'm constantly stressing. To, to clients when I'm prepping them for deposition, that you have to listen very question very carefully to the words of the question, digest it, and come to an answer. This is a very, very important thing. A lot of people think that, oh, I know where he's going or whatever, and you really need to listen to exact words. And the example I frequently would give them, in fact, invariably I would give, any every time I was prepping a client, I would I'd say to them, if they ask you, if he asks you, do you have the time? What is the answer to that? And if they say yes or no, no, that's not it. You say the time is, I mean, you could say, I don't have the time, or you could say, I don't know the time, or you can say it is, you know, it, 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 excuse me. I say, if he asks you, if you have, do you have the time? You do not, you never answer, oh, it's 1047. You never say it's 1047. You say yes or no. Listen to the words. Do you have the time? That's a yes or no question. So you say you don't give him the time. That's not the actual answer to the question. In my own brain, I got it backwards just now. So, yeah, Walker Voss. It seems obvious. Cash efficiently outlined the organization trying to authority and authorization cascade. Why counts this to be a directed verdict? Would a court elsewhere likely take that action? Okay, so the directed verdict. She addressed this at the very start of this <clears throat> of this stream that I skipped past. There was a brilliant motion for a directed verdict that Scott Gessler laid out before lunch. This is right after lunch, and and in the directed verdict, what he what you have you're basically saying taking everything in the light most favorable to the other side, disregard everything that we've said or whatever, just everything that you have in front of you, they must lose. That's what a directed verdict is looking for. So to answer your question, Walker, first and foremost, it wouldn't be. What, we have to assume that everything he's saying is a lie. All documents he's submitting to the, for defense is a lie if you're going to win on directed verdict. Still, I think he should have won the directed verdict because I think that he, that that Brandenburg that, that the Brandenburg standard basically says there's no way he did anything illegal. Anything he said, everything he said is not incitement under the law, and it's not incitement. You can't have any basis here. When I was I walked through by the end of the last. I think it was at the end. I think it was at the end of this morning session, not this video, but the, I broke it into two. So at the end of this morning session, I walked through ten different things that petitioners need to establish that if they lose on any ten of them, she should be issuing a directed verdict. They cannot possibly win. And 
And some of them seem so impossible for them to overcome that it's ridiculous that this case has made it this far, even. Whether whether the 14th Amendment even applies to the President of the United States, whether incitement can be considered engaging in insurrection, whether um, I mean there was just there was one issue after another, whether even if he should be kept off the ballot under the 14th Amendment, whether that precludes your ability, his ability to appear on the ballot. Just because he can't get on there, just because he can't get in, doesn't mean that you have the authority to use that to, to take him off of the ballot. And, for example, you don't know, and then something that Scott Gessler pointed out, which I hadn't thought of, was you don't know that, you know, when it comes to that section of the 14th Amendment, most people who were subject to it were the people who survived the Civil War, and they wanted to return to Congress. Well, most of them were pardoned. And we're able to serve as senators, serve in the House. So he basically was saying, you don't know that Congress will not pardon him for it. There's no way for you to be 100% certain that that's impossible to happen. So since that could happen, why are you taking him off the ballot? Why are we taking him off the ballot? Even if he's subject to it, and even if he, he should be excluded because of it, if he's pardoned by Congress, in that case, he's able to serve the same way everyone served in the 1870s. Who was who shouldn't have served? Since you don't know that, you it, you have no you have no cause to take him off of the ballot. That's a it's a it's a brilliant point. It's a brilliant point. And that's and and it, it was, I don't want to go through this morning's entire testimony, but he basically he made one he set up everything and the type of evidence that they had lo, laid out. And he said all their evidence you can break into three sections into stuff that happened January between election and January 5th or before January 5th going back in time five years the way they do with some stuff you can and then the second part is actions and things that happened on January 6th and then break down all the stuff that happened once they got into the and once the insurrection happened and the steps that arguably the, the left wants to say he should have taken at that point those are the three different kinds, and he broke down the flaws in each of those segments that they had there. And basically, he broke it down saying everything that happened before January 5th cannot possibly be held against him under the law, under the Brandenburg standard that was laid out by the Supreme Court. You cannot possibly, there's no such thing. And he, he cited, and then he cited a case on point and, and, ex, and exposed how the stuff that he said on January 6th was so much less than he actually said in another situation. He himself said and was sued. For for saying to it to he was screaming get out get out get out at a rally to some some disruptor and the guy got beaten up by his own people, and he was exonerated. They said no, he's allowed to say that, especially he especially since he followed it up with, you know, don't hurt him, and they said well you know he's he's being clear there, and that the case was dismissed. Because they said he's clearly expressing. You have to look at his plain words, his plain, and you, and you can never look at like context of like saying like like this means that that he means the exact opposite of what he's saying. You have to look at the plain words. The plain words are, "Don't hurt him." That's not code for "beat the hell out of him." So, so you know, he, he and he he cited he cited cases and and quotes from cases. It was great. It was really great. Not for her, not for this woman, because she determined that she was going to find him guilty no matter what. But for the appeal, for the appeal, it's it's a very important thing to put on the record, and he did he did a brilliant job of it. So she basically said, "Well, it's, well, the Secretary of State's lawyer came in here and argued that even if we win on the, even if you're going to win, what if what if I get overturned? Then it might not be the right procedure for the for a petition to have a directed verdict. So I'm going to just like hold off and and not not give you that. But even if I wasn't holding off, I still wouldn't give it because maybe uh, this coded language or this stupid stuff. It was just it was it was." It was so tilted. It was. I was just like, I was tearing. I, I was tearing my hat off. Review the committee's final report. Yeah, in large part, but not. I would say. I don't think I could say. I, I he's still in the chat. Maybe he can help. Did you look into the question earlier about Senate findings and their admissibility somehow in exclusionary, in exclusion to to hearsay rules? Oh, I don't know if he's still in the chat. But basically, I was asked this morning um, a question. That aren't Senate committee findings and exclusions to hearsay. And I said, I do not think that's the case. I do not think that's the case. And that you can just admit it. Hence, the implication being, hence, the January 6th committee report is not hearsay, which I was saying it definitely is. <clears throat> so if you're in the chat and you can weigh in whether Senate committee reports findings are an exception to hearsay, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I read every single page. 
Okay. Perfect. Did you look to see if you were mentioned in the report? With me and my counsel, a little background, we had an agreement with the committee that my testimony, since I was the first individual subpoenaed by the January 6th committee, we felt it appropriate that the transcript should be made public at some point. And after months long negotiations, they refused to do so and published their final report. And, it, and to my memory, it had been excluded. Um, and our counsel uh, took that up with the January 6th committee staff um, as to why the agreement had been violated. And I think on the eve of the dissolution of the committee, my transcript was the last one released. First in, last out. I have no further questions, sir. Please, sir. Thank you very much. Remember that. Okay, here we go. Here we go. This is where things start getting good. This lawyer getting up here has no idea that he's about to be taken behind the woodshed. I don't know if Cash Patel knows he's about to take him behind the woodshed, but he is. Let's slow this down. I think Jesse Benal was counsel for Trump in Nevada for Arizona. I was trying to remember where the name rings a bell when he was contesting. I think Arizona. When he was contesting. That's Jesse uh, Benal in the lower in, right uh, corner. Uh, and I was trying to remember why he was contesting election results in December of 2020. That's where I think I, got, I, I heard the name. And I thought, I, th I remember thinking that he was fairly competent from the limited. The limited amounts I saw of those proceedings. Sure. The cast did really well. They did really, really well. I don't know if they're going to cross him or not. That was he did really well, saying, "Look, we had everyone ready to go there." You want to know why they weren't deployed? Ask Nancy. Ask Muriel Bowser. As soon as Bowser asked for it, we sent them in. And they got there faster than ever before. Doesn't sound very pre-planned insurrection-y. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound very insurrection-y to have put in place beforehand and push them beforehand. Hey, you really probably want to take these folks. Doesn't sound very insurrection-y. That's part. Hello, sir. That's part of plausible deniability. I started my career as a federal public defender as well, so <laughs> uh, I want to start with the day January sixth. Uh, you were not at the White House on January sixth. I believe the entirety of the day we were in the Pentagon. You were at the Department of Defense. If you're joining late, this is me watching me from earlier today. The way you can tell us apart if I end up moving around, which I likely will end up moving around, is current time me has had on backwards intentionally to try and distinguish from earlier in the day me. So, yeah. That's correct. Yes. So I wish I could go back in time and warn current, my, current time me to pay closer attention. It's the Secretary of Defense's. Um, you didn't yeah. speak with President Trump on January 6th? I'm sorry? You did not speak with President Trump on January 6th? I don't believe I did. You did not attempt to reach out to President Trump that day? Why would I? I don't recall doing that. President Trump, to your knowledge. So that first answer, just by the way, is, look, you might find something that says I did. You're asking me now? I don't remember doing that. But did not try to reach out to you or <laughs> others at the Department of Defense? Why would you reach out to me? He did not. Well, try, I'm not sure, um, but uh, he may have spoken to other DOD leadership that day. Notice how he said try, I'm not sure. What, what's the question? Did Trump, Trump didn't try to reach out to you, did he? And he's thinking to himself, how would I know if Trump tried reaching out to me? Maybe he didn't, couldn't reach me. So that's why he said try, I'm not sure. To your knowledge, though, you have no knowledge of any such communication. I don't believe so. So? Um, you are aware that President Trump knew of the attack on the Capitol uh, by 1.21 p.m. in the <laughs> afternoon on January 6th, correct? Well, I'm not really sure when he knew of it. We didn't exchange communications on it. Well, you reviewed the January 6th report, is that correct, sir? Parts, he said. Uh, some of it, yes. And you saw in the January 6th report, finding 315, that... How many findings are in there? You saw finding number 315. He's like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. The committee found that President Trump knew the attack was underway. Well, a lot of what they got there was PM that evening. Dead wrong. Well, that's what the committee found, but that doesn't mean that's what I said. <laughs> or you have no I predicted what I predicted that in his brain, he's like, there's a lot wrong in that thing. So he's like, that's what they said. You have no reason to dispute that though, do you sir? Lots of reasons. A lot of their findings were crap. The well, I don't know what you're referencing. Can you show me that piece? 
Yes. Uncivil. How are you, Kurt? I'll send you a link. You can join if you like. No pressure, though. <laughs> the guy in the lower left is the one who's asking the questions. And if while you're here, you can hit like and subscribe. You see I would my screen that. or no? That doesn't just apply during the day. That applies. That's nighttime. Joe is saying while you're here, if you could hit like and subscribe, I would be much obliged. Thank you. I see you, sir. I don't see. This testimony is just evidence for the oh, appeal. We already know the judge okay. made up her mind before the trial was. That's true. Uh, and you That's see true. their uh, finding. Uh, it's actually a 316 by 121 p.m. President Trump was informed that the Capitol was under attack. Uh -huh. Do you see that? I see it. You have no basis to dispute that, do you, sir? No basis. Nor confirm it. I, I will just accept Believe what it. it's written. <laughs> <laughs> That's his way of saying, I think it could be it's complete crap. I have no idea what time. At some point, he was. they're saying it was at this time. I don't know what time that was. And I don't trust their fine. That's his way of subtly saying. And I like that he's saying it subtly. It's more effective because basically he's he is being he's being very shrewd in not and not agreeing and not and not refuting because he's like, I, I don't know what time he, he learned that. And I certainly don't trust your source that you're providing to me. So that's why he says nor confirm. It's his way of subtly saying this report is filled with lies and i can't i'm not and i certainly am not going to rely on on anything that's in that report to say that yes that's accurate and you said you had no communications <laughs> that you recall with president trump that day as best as i can recall <clears throat> you don't know who president trump may have spoken to that day do you no you don't you know, know he's pausing he's like let me think that through what's the question what's you know, do I know who he spoke to? He probably knows some people he spoke to, but he doesn't know everyone he spoke to. And he's like, and he's also likely thinking to himself, does does this hurt a case if I say no? And and then he comes to his quick conclusion. That all happens in a flash. And he's like, no. Oh, uh, so you can't say that President Trump reached out at any point in time to DHS that day while the Capitol was under attack? To DHS, like the secretary or just anyone over there? Well, to your knowledge, during the attack, President Trump didn't make any calls to DHS, FBI, DOJ. At this point, I was trying to, by the way, in case you're wondering why am I blocking cash here, is because I wanted to, my audience to be able to see the paper there. And when I have it in that position, the paper ends up getting, the, the, the document they're showing gets bigger. Like if I show you like right now, you see how much bigger that gets. So I wanted them to be able to have a chance of seeing it, which is why I, which is why I did it that way. But um, yeah, so that that's why that looks like that. But I I realize it in a moment, and I take myself. J MPD Capitol Police, correct? When you say any not yeah any calls, I'm not sure if leadership was called. I would have been notified because we would have been on the call. But leadership was not called. You were not notified of any such call by President Trump to any of those other federal law enforcement authorities to try and... that I'm aware of. And he's not going to catch cat. Yeah. So this this lawyer, what he's doing is he's trying to basically, if we're focusing here on, on the cat and mouse that's happening between lawyer and witness. So he's trying to basically catch him and say, you see, Trump wasn't taking enough steps to try and remedy the situation. He learned of the problem and wasn't taking enough steps to to remedy it. So he's starting off by asking him. He didn't call anyone at DHS. He's like, I don't know. I don't know who he called. I don't know who he spoke to. And now, and he's trying to pin him down to admit that Trump failed to take whatever step he's putting forth. You're not catching um, cash. He's and during the attack, him. President Senate. Trump didn't attempt, to your knowledge, to speak with Secretary of Defense Christopher Miller? I don't know. I don't... Maybe there was a phone call, but I'm not sure. We were... Um, we were occupied executing the deployment of the National Guard. Sir, you have no basis for saying that there was a call between President Trump and Christopher Miller that day. 
What is the point? I don't know that there was or there wasn't. And the reason I was asking what is the point, and the reason that I think Cash Patel is thinking what is the point, is Trump set up all the people in advance to take care of a situation like this. So why would he be bothering them when they're trying to take care of this situation as it's unfolding as rapidly as possible? It's almost stupid for him to be like, it's like calling up a surgeon in the middle of surgery and being like, did you, did you? Did, was the was the incision clean? Is the heart in your hand? Is it pumping in your hand right now? Can you feel it pumping? You, you don't do that. He put people in place beforehand for this potential contingency, and this and this lawyer is trying to say, "Aha! You see, he didn't care. He wasn't calling Chris Chris Miller to try and make sure everything's being taken care of." And it's like a ridiculous thing to try and cat, catch him on. And Cash doesn't even want to give him that. Patel is like is basically like, "I don't know what he did. I don't know if he did. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't." But he recognized Cash is intelligent enough to recognize it doesn't matter if he didn't call. But at the same time, he's like, I'm not going to give him anything. And that's what's so cool about this. What is the point? The point he had set all now, this up there in was advance. nothing preventing President Trump from sending out a tweet between 1 21 p.m. and 4 17 p.m telling supporters who are at the Capitol Objection to calls go speculation. home. Was there? Yeah, I don't know how his Twitter account works. Um, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear your objection. Objection foundation. <laughs> I'll rephrase. Okay. There is no authority that you're aware of, sir, that would have prevented President Trump from sending out a tweet between 1.21 p.m. and 4.17 p.m. telling the people to go home from the Capitol. <laughs> Not being the social media genius, I, I guess he could tweet. And, and you're aware of no authority that would prevent him from doing that, correct? Authority? No, but I'm not the legal expert. Well, you testified earlier a little bit. No, it's he's like, I'll give you the no on that. I'm, I'm not aware of it, but that doesn't mean it's okay for him to do it. Maybe it was. There was some sort of thing that prevented him under the law. Now, as an attorney, not that this is my area of specialty, I can't imagine what law would have prevented him. But he's he's not even giving him that. He's like, no, I'm not. But I wouldn't know. I'm not the attorney. About the history of the Department of Defense and how they utilize the D.C. National Guard. Uh, and you said, I wrote it down, uh, all the time and decades they've done it uh, right. this way. Did you say that? Yes, I. that's what the record reflects. Prior to November 9th, 2020, you had never worked at the Department of Defense. That's not true. When did you work at the Department of Defense, sir? That was my third tour at DOD um, over my government career. And this is when I started to realize he wasn't the guy from Parks and Recreation. <laughs> I was like, three tours at DOD? He's not that old? When was he doing Parks and Recreation? You had never been in the position of Chief of Staff to the Secretary of Defense before, had you? No, I only served that role once. You had never been Steve, you're here in the chat. Someone was asking, you might not but you might walk away from it. So I'm gonna ask you why you're here. Someone was asking me to follow up with you. If you know of an exception to hearsay rule where, where a finding, a Senate committee finding is an exception that is automatically admissible, where I said the J6 hearing report report to me seems like hearsay. And he was like, No, 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 Senate committee findings, which I guess this would be House committee findings also, that committee findings by Congress. Are an exception to hearsay and i was like i don't think that's true like i don't know any basis for that are you familiar with any are you familiar with that steve if you need to google it while we're here by all means but i'm not familiar with that at all matthew felty there was a bit of a bible discussion in chat today i'd like to promote the channel a flawed man of god i chat often Stuart is a layman and acquaintance of nick approaching 500 subs and currently going through the psalms all right well there you go flawed man of god <laughs> Matthew's Matthew highly recommends. He's investing that everyone here should check out a flaw the channel a flawed man of God. I've never I've never seen it myself. So I don't know. Maybe he's really good. Maybe he's really based. Maybe he'll help you in your religious endeavors. Maybe he'll he'll convince you that that you need to self-delete. I can't promise you what's gonna happen. But Matthew definitely wants you to check it out. Matthew's a pretty smart guy. So Flawed man of God, that was. Die, Ghostfish. The news said the Secret Service stuck him in a car at some point. Not sure what time of day that was. Maybe they took his phone. I don't know. 
Yeah. Check diggers for the rule. Uh, I'm supposed to check the diggers for the rule. For the rule. Uh, oh, look at that. Federal Rules of Evidence 803, subsection 830B, Charles Allen Wright, Federal Practice and Procedure. And the question is that applies to state court. The finding that congressional report and transcript to be official U.S. government reports, records, and statements under the public records exception to the hearsay rule. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. That's not something I ever had to deal with before. Entry required says, pausing is better than talking over the video. Geez, Joe, it's like watching a movie in a Harlem theater. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Entry required. I appreciate your perspectives. Can I get back to work now? <laughs> Everyone's making fun of me. All right, so there you go. I was wrong. I guess there you go. J6 committee report, it's in, and properly so. And responsible for deploying the National Guard. Prior to what date? November 9th, 2020. I had not, no, right? So they're talking about his background in history because he said this is the way it's been done for decades. Now the lawyer is trying to catch him and say, aha, you only, you you haven't been there. This is, you, what do you mean? What? How do you know what procedure is for decades? You haven't been there that long. He's like, what are you talking about? I've been in the DOD for over 10 years. Uh, so now this lawyer, instead of just seeding that, is trying to point out you were only in this position for two months. Okay. Does that mean he doesn't know how things are done if he was only in this position for two months? It's a stupid point that he's trying, he's desperately trying to make, but he's so frustrated in his inability to get anything out of cash, like literally frustrated. And cash is calmly sitting there. He's like, okay, I don't know. No, I'm not willing to confirm that. I can't refute it. I can't confirm. I'm not confirming it. He's, he's, and what's he do? He's not being evasive. He's simply thinking through every answer very carefully. Like, what am I conceding here? Do I really recognize that? And he doesn't look shifty. He doesn't look nervous. He just looks like he's actually thinking it through. So you were at the national, or you were at the uh, okay. Therefore. Defense Department as <clears throat> Chief of Staff from November 9th, 2020, and that was after the election, correct? Fair point. Yes. That was after the election had been called by media outlets for President Biden, correct? I think most media had. And then you stayed at the Department of Defense only until January 20th, 2021. Well, my right? Yes. So you had less than three months in the position, Chief of Staff, at the Department of Defense, correct? Objection yeah. relevance. Now, I want to talk about your testimony about 10 to 20,000 troops being authorized. Mm -hmm. um, you testified during direct that you attended a meeting in the Oval Office on, you say now, January 3rd, where President Trump, you say, authorized 10 to 20,000 National Guard troops. Is that right? Yeah, it's about Jan. It's about January third, but I think the timeline's accurate on it. And then you said you also testified that after the meeting, DOD somebody reached out to Mayor Bowser and Capitol Police, saying we've got all these people we can deploy. Do you want them? That would have been the Secretary of the Army. Yeah. So you didn't do that, did you? No, we gave the instruction. You didn't witness the Secretary of the Army do that, did you? She responded Witnessing to something. Do what? Sorry. Reach. Listen to how this, this attorney is so desperately trying. This is and this is indicative of how damaging the defense thought, the, the petitioners thought that Cash's testimony was. He's trying to get him on something so hard. He wants to get him on something. So he's like, well. You you claim you sent out this letter, but how do you know it got, it got to Muriel Bozer? How do you know how do you know she got it? How do you how do you know that it was sent to her? How do you know she got it? That's a, such a stupid argument for him to be trying to catch cash on because she responded to it and rejected it. So clearly she got something, but he's trying. She's like, you don't know that it was sent out. You weren't the one who sent it. You don't know it was sent out. See, there you go. There you go. And he apparently was a bad guess. <laughs> Cash Patel ain't no Aziz. Reach out to anybody at the mayor's office or the Capitol Police. This is such a no, stupid No, I didn't witness him. He went and then reported back to us. But you didn't see he him do it. back to you that he actually had talked to them. Yeah, that's how the chain of command works. 
Finally, uh, Cash is checking this guy. Bowser in the capital. Ben, slapping him over the, the over the you point over the January fifth letter, right? For Mayor Bowser, yes. Um, I want to dig into each one of those first, starting with the meeting where you say ten to twenty thousand troops were authorized. Okay. Um, and you said definitively that it was on January third. I think you even pointed to a bullet point uh, at one point saying it was January 3rd. Is that correct? Yeah, in the timeline. Well, let's pull that up. And this is exhibit 1027. This is the timeline. Yep. And you pointed to that third bullet on January 3rd, correct? Second bullet. I think council did, but yeah, okay, sure. Um, and you've already testified that you provided testimony oh, I'm there. and it was deposition testimony to the January 6th committee. Current time, Joe, yes. right here. Uh, you, that was yeah, under oath. Is current time, Joe. Yeah. Much closer in time to the actual events than we are here today. Yeah. Okay, so now, whenever, whenever you, if you're ever sitting in a deposition and someone is, is asking a question and they, they ask that question right there, that was more closer in time than it is to today. What they're trying to say is they think they caught you changing your testimony. And now you're saying something that is different than what you said when you were closer in time. This is an old strategy that attorneys have been using since the days of Thomas Jefferson and perhaps centuries before that. Is that you basically, have, you basically when you're questioning him, you want to lock him in and say, this is what you're saying. But you, you, you said something, you testify about something, you testify about this in the past. If you ever hear an attorney, if you're ever in a deposition, I'm warning, telling you now, if you're ever in a deposition and you hear an attorney asking you that question, that you testified about this in the past, didn't you? Yeah, and that was closer in time. They're basically saying your memory was better then when it was closer in time. What you're saying now is you're changing your story to be something you like better, but you admitted to something I like better back further in time. Cash Patel is intelligent enough to recognize that that's what's happening here. So... Let's see. Let's see how he handles this. And there's a whole dispute they get into over the date and time of everything. Was January 3rd or January 5th? And this attorney is going to lose it, lose it, as Cash basically stands completely strong and points out how 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 inaccurately he's understanding anything that was expressed. And you had actually brought with you to that deposition the DOD timeline. You remember that? Well, there's multiple DOD timelines that I brought. Yes. Yes, but this was one. He's of talking now about when he testified for the, the J6 committee hearing. Of them, and you brought another one too, correct? At least one other, yes. Um, and you remember you were asked uh, about when a meeting uh, or uh, when a meeting took place where you said In that general? 10 to 20,000 troops were authorized? Right. Yeah. Do you remember what you said? Uh, not off the top of my head. <laughs> Why would he remember something he said like two years ago? Hmm. This lawyer, I don't. <laughs> Uh, here we go. Let's I want to take you to page 43 of your deposition uh -huh. and go to line 12. Yep. Oh, sorry. Wrong page. I'm going to go to 38. Go to line two. Yep. And you're discussing there an article from Vanity Fair. Is that right? They were asking about it. <laughs> this is where things start going off the rails. If you thought things were bad till now, this is where everything starts going off the rails. When he starts getting into this whole this whole thing, he's like all tied up about this Vanity Fair article. And according to the article, we're like, we're going to provide any National Guard support that the district requests, Miller responded. And Trump goes, you're going to need 10,000 people. No, I'm not talking bullshit. He said that. Um, Okay. And then you answer, oh, so you remember stuff like that. So going off just memory, and we can go back to the article when you bring it up. There was a meeting with the president of the United States, acting Secretary Miller, and some others. 
And then you couldn't even remember who else was at the meeting, could you? I could definitively tell you, as I did them, what cabinet officers were there. I thought that was the important thing. Yeah, but I think you talked about the joint chair, uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff being there earlier today. Yeah. Yeah, and you were asked these questions in your deposition. Did you remember the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff even being at that meeting? Off the top of his head at yeah. that moment, he couldn't. No. What does it say here? And some others I can't recall off the top of my head. So you're specifically pointing to a line of questioning about the article. The article doesn't encapsulate the broadness of your question. I specifically stated at least five other times in that deposition that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was present along with the Secretary of Defense, the Chief of Staff, the President of the United States, myself, and White House Counsel, and others. Oh! Oh! <laughs> Let's go to page 43 of your deposition. But what about... <laughs> <laughs> it's like this lawyer it's like he's just basically this is what happens when you when you live in your own echo chamber that's what the problem the lawyer had here is he lived in his own echo chamber and basically somebody said oh here's a time he's saying he doesn't remember you need to focus in on that and he's not focusing on the rest of the transcript where he basically gives the same answer over and over again and he's confused about what this is referring to because at this point he's talking at this at this point in the previous earlier deposition with the J6 committee hearing, he he was being asked about you know a Vanity Fair article and what he remembered from that, and now and he's, they're trying to take that Vanity Fair thing and conflict it with like what he said in other places, and he's like, that's a that's a Vanity Fair article. That's a <laughs> thanks day and night Joe for this fantastic stream. Don't forget to like the stream, everyone. Like it twice. No, that's not good. That'd be bad. Three times is good. All right, put this article in the Daily Beast. <laughs> line 12 do you remember if general milley was at that conversation sorry which one the january 5th this conversation regarding the ten thousand troops to the best of my memory we usually were in the those oval office meetings with a number of folks so it was he could have been i just don't recall were you asked that question and did you give that answer yeah for a january 5th meeting so you're saying that there was a January 3rd meeting and a January 5th meeting now where 10,000 to 20,000 troops were discussed. No, I'm saying there was multiple meetings in the Oval Office <laughs> during that week and before. And this individual is reading again from either an article or a date he picked. As I said in the previous document you showed me, I said specifically it was January 4th or 3rd or 5th at that time. That was the best I could recall. So you had the timeline then. This was at the end of 2021. You were talking about dates. You couldn't remember whether it was the third, the fourth, the fifth. And now you're saying definitively it was the third that corresponds to that bullet point. I'm saying there was a meeting on the third definitively. I'm saying you can't correspond it to a specific bullet point because you're citing media articles that this prosecutor was asking me about at a specific time and setting. He's so confused. The lawyer is so confused. Oh. He's like, Wait, <laughs> I want to go back to. <laughs> He's so he confused because there's so many of these meetings. There's a meeting on the third. There's another meeting on the fifth. There's different people at different meetings. Some of them he remembers this guy being at. Probably the third. On the third is the first time they were talking about the National Guard, which is why he's remembering that he's remembering specifically that who was there when they're talking about National Guard because that's you know a novel thing for them to be talking about bringing the National Guard into D.C. So that's that's likely why he remembered it. But it's like also that they didn't talk about it just once. They probably would have talked about it on the fourth and on the fifth. It probably came up multiple times. So now he's being asked, was General Milley there on the 5th? And I mean, he's like, I don't remember if he was there. Maybe Milley was deployed somewhere. I don't know where he was. I remember he was there the first meeting on the 3rd. They keep trying to come back to this Vanity Fair article, and Cash is not giving in to them at all because the left is convinced. The left is convinced that Cash Patel made up this entire thing. If you really want to know the backstory behind this, the left is convinced that this meeting never happened. There was never any discussion because general – because and and they're basically trying to to establish that this entire thing is made up and cash is locked in and being like no this is what happened they was oh <laughs> and all i could say was oh that was my reference to um to a weird owl song oh 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 and that's all i could say was oh there's really one more thing <laughs> there's just more thing i really think you should know you can get unlimited refills. It's really one more sir. thing. <laughs> Just one more thing. There's no mention of ten to twenty thousand troops anywhere in that timeline, is there? 
No. There's no mention of 10 to 20,000 <laughs> troops anywhere in that IG report you discussed, correct? Not that I'm aware. Well, you looked through it both before your deposition and presumably today, no? I looked through some of the timeline. I didn't read the entire 600 page IG report. <laughs> well, you He's not even giving him that. He's not even that. He's like, I glanced through it. <laughs> think your lawyers or the people asking you questions would have looked for that if it were in there? You can ask them. <laughs> oh! They didn't ask you about that, though, did they? I'm not going to tell you what I talked to my lawyers about. Oh, my okay, gosh. Now, well, He's, it's like this guy keeps walking into stupid questions after stupid questions. Do you talk to lawyers about I'm not talking. I'm not telling you that. Do your lawyers look through it? I ask that. <laughs> so good. He's so good because he's thinking about what are they asking me? He's asking me what this other person did. And if you're going to ask me about what this other person did, I'm going to tell you, I don't know what they did. I have no way of knowing that. You want to ask me what Trump did? I don't know. I only know how, as it relates to me. You asked me, did he try calling me? And I didn't I didn't get the phone call? I don't know. Did he, Was he able to text? I don't know. Did he text? I don't know. Did he talk to, to, to Chris Miller? I don't know. Did your lawyers look through this thing before you did it? I don't know. It's a very simple thing. And I want you to know something. At a deposition, I don't know. It's a pretty effective answer. But at this point, he's so he's like he's like actually having fun with them. He's like, go ask them. I don't know. <laughs> Mr. Trump's lawyers are not your lawyers, right? No. Did you propose? I'm not going to tell you what I talked to my lawyers about. Oh my okay, gosh. Now, well, Mr. Trump's lawyers are not your lawyers, right? No. Did you prepare with them? Oh, this is so I good. prepared with my counsel. You didn't talk to them. My right. counsel had discussions with them. So let's look at that third bullet point, January 3rd, 2021. Um, you say that that bullet point, president concurs in activation of the DC National Guard to support law enforcement. Yep. That refers to 10 to 20,000 troops. In part, yeah. Uh, well, you know that the DC National Guard doesn't have 10 to 20,000 troops. Right, thank you for making my point. <laughs> yeah, and it says the activation of the DC oh National Guard, God, not other so National good. Guard units, correct? Oh my yeah. God, I'm loving this. He actually specifically said on direct, he said they have 2,500 troops in DC. The DC National Guard has 2,500 troops, give or take 50. Like he, he actually had to look that number up probably when this whole thing was happening. And he's like, okay, this is all we got. So now you, this lawyer is so stupid. Do you think that he doesn't realize that there's, that he's like, you know, they don't have 10,000. It's like, it's almost as if this lawyer wasn't paying attention because clearly Cash is not an idiot. And he's not going to say that there was 10,000 there when he, he says on direct that there's 2,500. He knows what he's talking about. So you should sort of like, ask, you can, instead of asking in an aggressive way, you said, you know, you said there was 10, if you don't understand him, which that happens, sometimes you might not understand. So you can sort of try and pin him down to, to get it. But in this accusatory tone of like, you know that they don't have 10,000. Oh, my God. And there was Gosh, a request though, that had come in on December 31st, as you can see in that timeline, for D.C. National Guard assistance, right? 346 people for traffic control. Traffic control, and there was a 40-person quick reaction force as well, right? I'm going to make myself small here because I want you to be able to peek in on the on the judge and understand the judge hates Trump hates Trump. Like she donated money to a to some organization and that was designed to to censure and go after Lawrence Bober and the, the Colorado Republican Party for failing to reject Trump based on the insurrection, which is why the which is why Trump said you have to recuse yourself. Are you kidding me? You're donating money to some organization that that that, that is seeking to punish them. And she, she said, I'm not recusing myself because I don't remember spending the money. So that's how much she, she dislikes Trump. That's why we're, everyone's fully expecting that she's going to find for the petitioners here. And it's going to have to work its way through the appeals, probably perhaps all the way through the Colorado uh, um, uh, Supreme Court and arguably to the Supreme Court of the United States. That's how much she hates Trump. But even she starts laughing at how cash is crushing her. And that's why I want you to, that's why I want to try and leave this. I'm going to leave myself down here in the lower middle. So I'm not blocking cash, I'm not blocking old me. And and you'll be able to hopefully be able to see her as best as as I was as I was enjoying. <laughs>
like she was having a good time like laughing at how this this law this lawyer was getting was get was just getting tattooed like like you could see his gluteus was just getting redder and redder as cash is like it's like it's like slap 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 yeah the criff is staged off site uh and that's mentioned in on december 31st 2020 that entry the request I don't see the QRF in this timeline, but if it's there in a different place, it's there. And you see then that January 3rd after that refers to the president concurring in the act activation of the DC National Guard. Mm -hmm. and 340 troops and 40 quick reaction force would have been with the DC National Guard. Yeah. Um, and then January 4th, it talks about 340 troops and a quick reaction force as well. Mm -hmm. You see that? No mention yep. of 10 to 20,000 National Guard troops. No. Um, now, is there any documentation anywhere that you can point to? Now, you can't see it now. Documentation? But the person I was that I guess someone pointed out correctly that's younger me and I'm older me, <laughs> the current time me. You can't see it now because I'm, I'm blocking it, but Kurt showed up. So, so that's why. And I, I just brought him up on stage. That's who I was waving to there. So. Saying that 10 to 20,000 troops were authorized. I don't have it on me, but it's in the internal DOD memorandums delegating authorities to the Secretary of the Army, the DC <laughs> National Guard, and our adjutant generals and the major general in charge of the entire National Guard force. I don't have those memorandums. So what he's basically saying is you're claiming, you, you try and imply I made it up. There's all these other records. Just because you're not looking at those records doesn't mean there aren't records that, that show that they were authorized. Where is that document, sir? Well, maybe it's, it's in God's basement. They're at the Department of Defense. <laughs> And was that produced to the January 6th committee? I asked them to get it. They didn't get it. You've seen no public documentation anywhere at any point in time that's out of the public. It says 10 to 20,000 troops were authorized. It's such a stupid thing. Why would anyone have access to those records when you just said it's in the DOD records? When you say documentation, by whom? By anyone. I've seen lots of media articles saying that that is exactly what happened. Well, you've seen media articles quoting yourself, sir. I'm not the only one that quote. You asked the question if I've seen it in anyone in anywhere, and I've seen it with dozens of people in school. The judge is laughing. Do you have any of those articles on you, sir? No, but if you got the internet, we could look it up. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, Cash. It's like this lawyer doesn't know when he's beat. This, this now, you remember kid. the Vanity Fair article? I have no idea when he's about. In part. Oh my God! Wave the flag. Wave what it. What kind of question is that? Do you remember the Vanity Fat Flag or Fire article? Yeah, this which is, one? Um, I'm showing you what's been marked. Two ninety-two. Uh, do you see that article there, sir? Yes, sir. Is that the Vanity Fair article? V. Uh, yeah, I'll take your word for it. I can't. It's kind of like. Objection, Your Honor. This was not timely disclosed to us as a cross-examination exhibit. I believe it was. We have it marked as an exhibit. This was not on the list given to us by the deadline on Sunday. We received well, it this morning, apparently. Well, you all have supplemented the exhibit list quite a number of times uh, yeah. shortly before. So if this is for impeachment overall, Tom. Um, now, there was a reporter from Vanity Fair who was actually embedded with you all um, for some period of time in the transition. Yeah. And that reporter then uh, wrote an article that was published shortly after uh, the Biden administration took over. Is that right? I'll let the article reflect the date. I don't have it off the top of my head. And there's a discussion of when there was a meeting where you say 10 to 20,000 people were, uh, were authorized, January 5th. That's it. That's what it says. Christopher Miller said, according to that reporter. Yeah, you read that article and you didn't. So <clears throat> I have to, I'm going to just pause and take myself out of here for a moment so you can actually get a better angle of it. That's that's probably better. Sorry for blocking you.
sorry for blocking your card here. So Chris, so the article says on the evening of January 5th, this is what this is what Aziz was just sorry, Cash was just reading. On the evening of January 5th, night before a white supremacist mob stormed Capitol in a siege that would have leave five dead, which that's not true. It didn't leave five dead. It left one person. Dead. Um, the acting secretary of defense, Christopher Miller was at the White House with his chief of staff, Cash Patel. They were meeting with President Trump on an Iran issue, Miller told me. But then the conversation switched gears. The president, Miller recalled, Miller recalled, asked how many troops the Pentagon plans to turn out the following day. We're like, we're going to provide any National Guard support the district requests, Miller responded. And Trump goes, you're going to need 10,000 people. No, I'm not talking BS. He said that. And we're like, maybe. But you know someone's going to have to ask for it. That's that's the conversation. So now this, this lawyer is asking um, is asking Cash, you're quoted as saying that you're going to need 10,000 people. And he's like, I'm not quoted. That's Chris Miller who's being quoted there, not me. But it's like he just couldn't even read the article properly. That's, it. That's what it says Christopher Miller said, according to that reporter. Yeah, you read that article and you didn't correct them at all, did you? I didn't read the article. When? <laughs> when the Vanity Fair article came out with your name in it about you with a guy embedded. He's in a lot you of didn't a, read the Vanity Fair article? articles. I had my office of uh, communications read the article, but we, we get a thousand articles a day. No, I can't read them all. I'm sorry. You get a thousand articles Look at a the day judge laughing. You from Vanity Fair. Not me, but I'm not Vanity Fair. Like big you're the end all be all. Oh, it's Vanity Fair. So that goes to the no property. The no fail mission, withdrawing out of Afghanistan, saving American hostages, and securing our border. I don't care what Vanity Fair is. They don't cite either the USA no, Today or the National Enquirer before, before, before this is over. I'm sad. I don't know. You keep showing me a piece of the article. I have no idea when it came out. Um, well, the reason January 5th is kind of important is Mayor Bowser sent her letter on the 5th, didn't she? Okay. And you say that there was this meeting where stuff was authorized, 10 to 20,000 troops, there's no record of it. You then, somebody went from the Department of Defense to Mayor Bowser's office, to the Capitol Police, requesting if they need some assistance. And then on January 5th, Mayor Bowser writes a letter back. Right? You say there's no record of it, but okay. 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 Writes a letter back in January. 5th. Even that he's not going to see. He's like, he's like, you're trying to twist. He's trying to twist Cash's testimony. He's like, that's what you're saying. There's no record. He just went through how there's in the DOD record and there's this record and that record. He's he, he listed like six different records that reflect the ten thousand that the ten thousand people were asked. But uh, you're saying there's no record. Okay. Even you know what time even that is, is giving him nothing. Is giving him nothing. Do you know how frustrated this lawyer is by this point? He hasn't gotten anything and he clearly thought that cash had to be skewered and he is instead cash is basically smacking him around in everything he's saying and pointing out how inaccurate he is and we haven't even got to the funniest parts yet wrote that letter back sir i don't I let's oh, look at it 1031 you can't refute that she that she wrote it at 11 45 a.m can you you cannot refute that can you <laughs> uh, cash that's is... my knowledge base for sir i can't speak to the finer habits of the mayor cash cash is killing this guy this oh my god he's just like drowning he's like help someone throw me a life preserver yeah there's no way i can get around blocking him But uh, apparently, Ferris says you're wrong. Mm -mm -mm. You aware that Vox News says that Trump failed to protect In the, the Capitol? DOD IG report? It says that she wrote the letter at two twenty-seven p.m. You have any reason to dispute that? No. And in the Vanity Fair article we just looked at, it said that the evening where you say ten to twenty thousand troops were authorized was in the evening of January fifth. Objection mischaracterizes the testimony. Also, it's Christopher Miller in the article, not me. So now he's saying firm to it. He's like, what the hell are you talking about? I told you already, it's Christopher Miller, but he keeps trying to say, you said it. 
Is he now Christopher Miller? Over, the paragraph you showed me in Vanity Fair was Christopher Miller speaking. Yeah, and it says on the evening of January 5th. Right, then it says Miller recalled, Miller said. <laughs> it doesn't say I said. So you think Mr. Miller is talking about a different meeting? I don't know. You can ask him. Good answer. Good answer. That is a good answer, Kurt. He's so good at this. Oh my gosh. This is amazing. Um, is there any record, public record, that you've seen documenting a request or an offer from President Trump or the Department <coughs> of Defense to Mayor Bowser or the Capitol Police of 10 to 20,000 troops? We would not have made a request. We would have presented them with the authorization, which we did through Secretary of the Army. And it's there's no record of that in any of the timelines we looked at, sir, 1031. 1027 of of secretary army going there yeah and offering 10 to twenty thousand troops what letter why would she send a letter if there wasn't an offer why would she say a letter saying i'm rejecting your offer for national guard unless they actually had sent an offer of a national guard that's the stupid part the stupidest part of this entire line of questioning he thinks he's going to score a win because <laughs> apparently muriel bowser said the claim claimed i never got an offer of, na- of ten thousand troops coming from national guard well then why are you sending a letter on the fifth what made you send that letter? What prompted that? Saying, don't send your National Guard in here. I don't know if that's in the timeline or not, but he went there and reported back to us, and that's why we didn't mobilize. There's no record of that, though, in the timeline. Correct, sir? The time, yeah, the timeline speaks for itself. But it's not exhaustive. That was never the purpose of the timeline. So it's not exhaustive, but you put in stuff about 340 troops, but not ten to 20,000 troops? No, because at the time, that was the specificity with numbers at which we had for actual deployment. Meaning, the question from the lawyer is, why would you make such a big deal about 340 when you didn't and and never mentioned anything about the 10,000 in your timeline? And he's like, well, the 340 is what they approved. So that number was a number we put down. The 10,000 was never approved. So we have to know what those 340 are. I mean, that, that was real rather than just theoretical. So that's why we had a specific number. Oh, sorry. I forgot I said that. <clears throat> now, you've said that this meeting took place now on January 3rd. Maybe it's on January 5th. No, you didn't There's say maybe. Meetings. Objection. But you've also been out there happening. talking about how there was a meeting on January 4th, haven't you, sir? Yeah, as I've said, I've testified to the best of my ability. We had a lot going on. If I'm off by a day, you know, sue me. But I'm telling you what happened to the best of my ability. That doesn't change the fact that the authorization came in beforehand. It was relayed to the appropriate officials in D.C. and the Capitol Police. It was declined, and we acted when their request finally came in on January 6th. So if you want to argue about me on January 3rd, 4th, and 5th, I guess we can keep doing this. Well, sir, it's, it's <laughs> kind of important because you're pointing to a timeline and saying it was on January 3rd. Then there's an article saying it was January 5th. Then there's something else. <laughs> two different January meetings. Fourth, you on interviews. And then there's a letter that's sent on January 5th, which you say is a response to a request. This guy's like the Black Knight. An offer for POD. It's just so a flesh wound. It does matter, sir. <laughs> Objection. Doesn't it? Objection. Objection. Argumentative that all how characterized his testimony and mischaracterized the article. Um, it was argumentative. You can redirect on all those. On argumentative, you don't you don't redirect on argumentative. Argumentative is that you're basically just like yelling at the guy. You don't redirect on that. But this is a rookie. This is a rookie judge. She literally got sworn in in January of this year and has no clue what she's doing. Literally, is, is no clue. Why didn't he put two point one million? It's right there. Two point one million in what? I'm confused. Oh, it's in the article, <laughs> the idiot. Maybe it's important to you. That's why you're asking about it. Do you recall what Secretary Miller said about whether there had been 10,000 troops ordered to be deployed? There were never 10,000 troops ordered to be deployed. Just authorized. Right. That's a big difference. But you do recall that Christopher Miller said there was no such order? 
I don't, I don't understand what you're asking. When would Christopher Miller, this acting secretary of defense, if you could probe me to a time saying this statement about an order for 10,000 people? I'm going to show you the January 6th report. This is page uh, 95. Keep coming back to this report. What? What? Alexa ordered two tons of cream corn confirmed purchase. You know, I don't have Alexa, right? <laughs> I don't know what that means. I don't have Alexa. Oh, <laughs> Alexa. <laughs> I didn't realize that power. That's pretty cool. Alexa, turn the TV up louder. <laughs> <For it. clears throat> Finding specifically on this issue. Some have suggested that President Trump <clears throat> gave an order to have 10,000 troops ready for January 6th. The select committee found no evidence of this. In fact, President Trump's acting secretary of defense, Christopher Miller, directly refuted this when he testified under oath. Committee staff, to be crystal clear, there was no direct order from President Trump to put 10,000 troops to be on the ready for January 6th, correct? No, right. yeah, that's correct. There was no direct, there was no direct order. That's absolutely right. There was no order because that would have been unlawful as we understood it. There was an authorization. There is a huge difference. He keeps saying that over and over again. The difference between an order and an authorization. We authorized 10,000. We sent zero until we got approval. Well, this guy keeps coming back to it. He says, so the committee staff asked Miller, he said, to be crystal clear, there's no direct order for President Trump, for President Trump to put 10,000 troops to be ready on for January 6th. Yeah, they weren't. They weren't because they weren't deployed. So they're not considered ready. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, sir, you're the current. What's, what's your current job for President Trump? I'm a senior advisor for national uh, for national security and defense. And how long have you been in that position? About a year. Um, you're advising President Trump on what he might do during a second administration on policy um, and other matters. And are you paid by the Trump organization? No. Nothing. The Trump organization does not pay me. Sorry, are you paid by President Trump or any representative to, of his? I can work with my counsel on who exactly pays me, but I don't think those are either of those two are them. Because he's not sure what his representative means. It's a company that's controlled by him. But what does a representative mean? That's why he's sort of like torn. Like he's like, I'm trying. I'm not really understanding your question here. Does any organization affiliated with President Trump currently pay you? Yes. What? Uh, it's one of his packs. What pack? I believe it's Save America. How much does President Trump's Save America pack pay you per month? Fifteen thousand. That's not a crazy. How number, much has President Trump said that a year? Pack paid you since you began working? It's been a, maybe a year, maybe just under. So whatever that adds up to be. Over two hundred thousand dollars. That's clearly not. No, that's not how you do math. It's over a year. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think so. I have to check the math. And you'd get a position in the second Trump administration, do you think? I don't know. Objection, speculation. Not really. Also, um, wouldn't pay that much. So now you've written a few books, haven't you? This is where it gets a uh, children's book and a, a new book. Yes, and the children's book is actually about President Trump. You yes. don't want to be asking these questions. You don't want to be asking these questions. Counselors, sit down. Counselors, sit down now. Sit down. In part. Um, 
the relevance and those questions about his it's a series called the plot against the king and uh trump is the king king donald yeah it takes place in medieval times it's about russia gate for kids and the first uh book the uh villain is hillary quinton yep uh king trump <laughs> is accused of it being a shifty knight <laughs> <laughs> or accused by a shifty knight find this book. of right. cheating to get the throne. I gotta find this you're in the book. story, you're a wizard who yep. protects Donald Trump. Uh, I think it's more portrayed as protecting the truth, but sure, it's a children's book. Go for it. And uh, Trump said uh, he wants to put that book in every school in America. I think he posted about it, yes, if that's what you have the quotes to be. It's and only 990. You actually have oh, a website, totally uh, fightwithcash.com. It's one of my websites. And you sell kind of swag on that site? Swag. <laughs> Do you sell swag? You sell swag. What the? Where do you come up with that word? Do you sell swag? You sell swag, don't you, sir? You sell swag. Admit it. I do for charitable givings. And I just want to look at, at some of those. Look at the judge laughing. In honor of Cash's awesome work. I'm just going to pimp this out. Plot Against the King paperback. Amazon. 990. 990. All I ask is they say, hey, Cash, you got to appear on Good Logic. If you could like put in the notes there. Cash, I found you on Good Logic. Another book I can uh, read on screen. Still, uh, very swag. Uh, I think you sell uh, OMB or Orange Man bad swag there. Yeah, when you say swag, merchandise. And merchandise. Yeah, what does or Orange Man bad stand for? Is that really true? Just one of the things. Did he? Does he have read the swag <laughs> on Parks and Rec? That's amazing. He's confused also. He's good. <laughs> You rent swag, don't you? I saw you on TV renting swag. I saw it. Don't try to deny. <laughs> Things you see on the media describing President Trump. So we thought it would be a good way to make money and give it away. We've given away hundreds of thousands of dollars to children and veterans and active duty military in need. Orange man bad refers to liberals who don't like President Trump, right? I think that's one way. Well, you can tell me. I don't know. <laughs> and you wrote another book called Government Gangsters. Is that right? I did. And Government Gangsters is about your view that there's a cabal or deep state out there that is trying to ruin our country. It's not my view. In the book, it's outlined for their actions. And you write the book about the deep state, right? In part. Um, <coughs> is this proceeding part of the deep state? No, it's a law enforcement proceeding. Uh, am I part of the deep state? I don't know. I don't really know you. Is the judge part of the deep state? I think the judge is beyond reproach, but if you want to get into it, we can. Frankly, oh! so such a good answer. <laughs> such a great answer. Are you part of the deep state? I don't know. Is the judge part of the, the deep state? I think the judge is beyond reproach. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that he knows this judge is totally is totally like a crazy lefty. I think the judge is beyond reproach. But if you want to get into it, <laughs> you nice think yes. that all liberals or liberal so leadership good. are evil, right? That's that's outrageous. I worked more in the Department of Justice for Deputy Attorney General Sally Yates than I ever did in a Republican administration. We meted out wonderful cases in the Where National Security Administration. Now? I worked as a public defender for eight years. I'm not sure how uh, executing yeah. due process. So if you want to make that globalization because the cameras are on, you can go right ahead. Uh, <laughs> but I don't believe that. <laughs> oh, God, this is so good. Yeah. Miss Phillips is a deep state <laughs> problem. Deep state just walked in right now. <laughs> I'm kidding. You're not deep state. <laughs> Stupid. Start. There we go. I have to wonder, Cash, if everything I said before about people being too stupid, it's in fact that the leadership is as stupid, right? Of course. The leadership is, no, no. The leadership is evil. They're not stupid. <laughs> There's a distinction. Yeah. I've worked with all of these people. They are pure evil. 
The only thing the Pelosi's and the Schumer's and the and the like care about in the world is being glorified in the media. That's it. What's my next headline? What's my next payday? How do I scam the stock market with my husband? How do I come out on top and be Speaker of the House for more than basically a decade? That is the track that people come in behind them on and say, I want to be the next star. I want to be the next him. They are evil. That's the problem. The people that follow them? Yes, yeah, stupid. That was you in an interview, sir? Yeah, talking about specific leadership. Not everybody. Yeah, that's fair. That's what he said. He even finished it with like the people behind them are the stupid ones. It, it's the people at the top who, 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 are, who are evil. It's so based. Such a based comment. Now, you also serve currently on the board of directors for the Trump Media Group. Is that right? I do. But his whole thing, long- his whole thing in bringing that up and Tim Pool is trying to show you, see, he's a crazy conspiracy guy. He's a crazy conspiracy guy. Oh my God, he's a crazy conspiracy guy. So, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. He's like, I'm not saying it's a conspiracy. I'm saying those people are evil. Like, what do you, what do, what do you think you caught him on? What did you catch him on? What did you get there? He's so desperate to catch him on something. He's like, give me something I catch you on. How long have you served in that position? Um, probably a year and change, maybe. And the Trump uh, Media and Technology Group uh, owns and runs uh, Trump's social media platform, uh, Truth Social. I, I think, yeah, in part. And how much are you paid as a director on the board of directors uh, for Trump Media and Technology Group? Zero. Uh, who else is on that uh, board with you? Um. If I could just ask my counsel if that if I'm allowed to publicly relay that, I don't know if that documentation is public or not. If I am, I'm happy to tell you. I'll tell you that it's in the Secretary of State filings from Florida. Okay. If it's public, then it's uh, myself, um, Dan Scavino, Donald Trump Jr., and I think former President Trump. I think if if my memory serves me. And former President Trump is the chairman of the board. I think that's his title. Devin Nunes is president and CEO. Correct. Yeah. Therefore, therefore, what do you what How did you get? Do uh, as needed. Even that. Last time you met? Maybe a month ago. I'm not really sure. Literally gives him nothing, nothing, and all it takes is just being confident. And listening. So much of what we do, we fail to actually listen. And that's one of the lessons that I think you can take from this deposit, or you can take from this cross examination as to the value of listening. Do you know how much praise he's getting? All he's doing is he's sitting there, he's digesting, he's listening, and he's staying true to, to he's, he's staying true, and he's basically not giving an inch on anything he wouldn't even confirm he's like that's what your report says i can't confirm that i don't know i don't know that's what you're saying okay i i'm gonna stand true on everything that i that i say and anything anyone else did said or whatever i cannot say i don't know but the point is it's not just at a deposition when you stay true to yourself the way the way he is throughout this entire cross-examination and he stays calm and confident and actually listens to the other side it gives himself it's this attorney isn't even listening to the answers half the time you can tell because of all the questions he kept repeating and didn't even understand the difference between authorization and ordering even though they went through it like six times and that's the reason that one looks brilliant and the other looks like a fool it's all about just not paying attention and digesting what does that really mean how does that impact everything and this attorney isn't even recognizing that the things he's trying to poke on give me something here give me something here how much money did you make from this being on the board of that zero even if he even if he made like three thousand dollars a month ten thousand what are you getting out of this everyone knows he likes Donald Trump you're so, but he's so desperate to get something from him and it's and he, he's he's being governed this attorney is being governed by his emotion where his cash is sitting there calmly employing his brain and not allowing himself to get rattled it's just awesome you see the the utter value of that that that's all the difference between who ends up looking like a man and who ends up looking like a desperate little child who is not getting anywhere 
Now you had testified on. In most things that you're going to testify about a deposition, the, the answer I don't know is perfectly fine. It's perfectly fine. In general, certain things you need to know, but most much of what you get asked at a deposition, I don't know is a is is pretty it's pretty solid answer. Direct that uh, the FBI could have sent troops out. Uh, to protect the Capitol on January 6th, is that right? Well, not troops, but 1811 agents, federal law enforcement. So yes. federal law enforcement officers, right? And by the way, right. a lot of people are, are embarrassed uh, to ever say, I don't know. And that's and that weakness ends up being their undoing. Being Having the confidence to say, I'm totally cool saying, I don't know, is actually a strength. It's it's a strength of character. And he, dis he displays it over and over again. I'm totally fine saying, I don't know. Uh, and the FBI reports ultimately up to the president? To the DOJ's attorney general and then to the president. So up to the president, though. Well, every cabinet secretary does. And you're not aware of the president making any phone calls to DOJ to authorize release of the FBI or FBI agents on January 6th? Awesome. No, what, what my concern was, was that Director Christopher Wray was on none of the leadership calls and that DOJ had been designated the lead law enforcement agency for January 6th and was not taking the appropriate preemptive measures to secure the Capitol grounds. So we were working internally to try to get them there, but unfortunately they never did. The us, the DOD did not- At least have not in uniform, maybe undercover the FBI was there. And Christopher Ray <laughs> is one of the members. It's true, they were there. The FBI was there. The FBI was there. Um, <clears throat> Just me said, damn it, Joe, I want my super chat back. I just got busted sneaking a cigarette because my wife wants to know why the TV was playing away. And I unplugged that. <laughs> and Alexa, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got, I got talked into it. I got, I got, I got, I got. <laughs> uh, I didn't realize this. This is something until someone sent me a super chat that because some people have me playing, that if I tell Alexa to do something, that, plays in their house and i basically you know <laughs> so if i say alexa turn off all the lights it just has an impact <laughs> if if i were to say <laughs> not that i ever would because i wouldn't want to do that to anyone but <laughs> uh. members of the deep state that you identify in government oh yes yeah, was there right? I think Christopher Ray is one of the members as a director of the FBI that we've caught lying. So yes, in part. And who are the other members of the deep state that you've identified in government gangsters? Objection, Your Honor. At some point, this is just irrelevant. Why don't you move on, Mr. Crimsley? Thank you. I'm done. <laughs> move on is means what's the next question? Well, yeah, I think it means like all this work you're trying to do to try and show that he's biased. It's like and because of his his sentiment about government has gotten to be like badgering at this point. Do you have any further questions, Counselor? He's, I think he's running out of steam, which is a shame because I could watch Cash beat up on him all day. I might watch. I might rewatch this tonight. Really, Your Honor. <laughs> okay, we're done. <laughs> Does um, the Colorado Republican Party have any questions? No, Your Honor, we do not. Mm. Okay. Any redirect, Mr. Shaw? Just a couple of quick questions, Your Honor. Oh, okay. Mr. Patel, um, to your mind, is there anything inconsistent with the president telling you? Um, on January 3rd, that he thought uh, that he was authorizing 10 to 20,000 troops, and then telling you on January 5th that you're going to need 10,000 troops. No. Um, to your understanding, would Department of Defense typically, when it reaches out to local authorities, offer a specific number of troops or would it offer to provide what um, local authorities need? 
Well, that's part of the conversation. We would say, here's the here's the cap so far. What are you having? A Super Bowl, a parade, a protest? What are you anticipating? What's the threat analysis, intelligence landscape? And then we work back and forth. And if it superseded that threshold, we'd go back and get the appropriate authorization. So there's always a back and forth. It sounds like he knows what he's talking about. Oh, thank you, Mama Four. You're too kind. I don't have any further questions, sir. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And this is where things got a little weird. Mr. Patel, thank you for your testimony today. Right here is where things got a little weird for me personally. So I'm going to just play another couple of minutes and let you guys, um, yeah. Hey, you're released. Thank you, Your Honor. She looks like she liked him, even though she carries the look of a Biden voter. <laughs> Everything about her. I didn't see Parent Trap, so I don't know the reference. But I assume you're talking about two, uh, two of me. Uh, this right here. So our is... next witness is also on WebEx, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, we just need to get her lined up unless the court wants to take a short break. Well, is she on standby? She's logging in right now, Your Honor. She's logging in right now. Okay. Let's just do at least the direct of her unless... I'm going to put me over here so you can see me started. in real time. Mm -hmm. Actually, I forgot to change this. You can see old me, um, and you can see... What do we got here? How you doing, Kurt? I'm doing well. How are you? Thank God. This is Uncivil Law who joined me now. And uh, brother... So where are you? You don't look like you're home. You're on the road? I am not. I'm visiting my parents. Oh, that's so cool. And who is this witness? And then my best. Katrina Pearson, Your Honor. Okay. P-I-E-R-S-O-N. I can't watch. -E. I can't watch. So this I got stuff. a little webcam action here and a little lav mic. and Nice. We do what we can. Oh, I can't watch. This is about to get bad. Katrina Pearson. This is about to get bad. Your Honor, while we're waiting, we've there's one issue. We've been informed that somebody is live streaming the court proceedings on the internet uh -oh. uh, without permission to record it and to sort of doing commentary as it Did goes you get busted? beyond the scope of who's there. I, I mean, I don't know how to get in touch with them, but maybe an admonition what? that they're watching that they can't do that without permission what? might be appropriate. And we know that they're not part of the expanded media coverage? Yes, yes. Is this me? You get busted. Is this me? Are you talking to me? Do we know you talking what to me? organization it is? It appears to be an individual, Your Honor, but there were like 7,000 people watching them. 7,000? I, I have 1,900. I'm turning further, it's now 8,600. I was so offended. Okay, good. It's so like Ashley 7, Okay, Who's you that? Didn't get busted. Ashley Depp? Yeah, EPP. I didn't think I was doing anything wrong. I was so confused. Ashley Depp? Who the heck Epp. is Ashley Depp? Apparently, app. App. I need to log in. Well, so Wait, I'm not trying to do some. I. What is the? I want to make it clear uh, that there are very specific statutes and rules in place in the state of Colorado for videotaping proceedings, and there's a process. It only applies to actual media outlets, <laughs> and you My need media. to request and be granted per permission to record any proceedings. So At this moment, I feel like she's talking, express, she's looking into the camera to talk to me. That's what I felt like at this moment. To the extent that there's anybody currently recording proceedings, you uh, are in violation of the court's <laughs> orders. And if you continue to do so, you will be in further violation of the court's orders. What the heck? But it only applies to actual media organizations. What the hell I don't, does that is mean? that apply to me or not? Wait, yeah, is that because yeah, she just said she just said just now it only applies to whatever I actual a media, media organization? organizations are. What does I, that mean? I'm gonna tell you I right don't know. I'm gonna tell you right now. I still don't know what she means. I still don't know what she's talking about. I have no idea what she is talking about. I was so confused, and I'm like, and I'm still confused. I don't know what she's talking about. I don't know why this court would have authority over me the same way, I don't know, some court in Cambodia would have authority over me. They're a foreign jurisdiction. I don't practice there. I don't have anything to do with it. I, I don't know. Maybe a Colorado attorney has to has to listen to that. I don't I don't understand 
why New York rules of ethics or any, oh, I'm sorry, the Montana rules of ethics, which is where I practice. Uh, <laughs> I don't understand why the, Mon why the Montana rules of ethics would care, seeing as how I'm in Montana. I'm in Montana. Why would Montana rules of ethics, where I practice my law in Montana, why would they care? Why would they care? <laughs> I don't know. I want to also know who, who, what was her name? What the Ashley heck? Epp. Apparently Epps, like the uh, guy who attacked on Gen 6, Epps. Ashley, Epp. I don't know what I'm supposed to That's what I, I heard. Epp. I don't know what that means. EPP. I don't know who that is. Yeah. Look, I'm not, look, look. I got it. I got it. <laughs> mm. Mm. I don't, is this me? I'm not recording it. Is this considered recording? I'm no, streaming. I'm not recording. I'm not saving yeah. it. I don't know if that's yeah. I don't know if that qualifies as recording or not. Actually, I don't know what's happening. Yeah, does that qualify as recording? That's I a don't good know. Point. She, look, she's definitely identifying someone else, but I, I can't play stupid and pretend that like it, it didn't sound like it could be that she was that that she's addressing that I'm incorporating what she just said there. It could be. <laughs> it could be. I don't know. I really don't know. I really don't know where I practice law, in Montana. <laughs> I'm, I'm Joe Montana. <laughs> Uh, God, I don't know. I don't. I still don't know, <laughs> Montana Joe. Yeah, but then she says, "Well, this only applies to actual media organizations." Are we an actual media organization? What does that mean? What I don't is know. An if actual that's, media organization. I don't know what. It, I don't know, and I don't know if she was saying the opposite that it's like only actual media organizations can record, which sounds ridiculous. I don't understand what's happening here. <laughs> and I'm okay. Well, how about this? Is you're anyone my, okay. else? Is anyone else broadcasting it? Because you, can I get don't it know there. of anyone else who's broadcasting. I know well, I do who Ashley Epp sure. is, other than Ashley Epp. <laughs> that would be a really bad pronunciation of good logic. Ashley Epp. Who's Ashley Epp? Can she clarify this? Help. Look, it's. Can we get? Can we get? Sure. I have to call the judge's office. So what do we have to do now? What do you? Th what do you think? Fine. I don't. This is. Uh, I don't know. Is Miss Pearson on? I was really torn. I was like, I don't know what to do here. Yeah, technically, we're not recording <laughs> it. Yeah, I'm still digesting. That's why I'm making that. <laughs> I don't think you have the authority to stop me. I don't think you have the sort of authority to stop me. <laughs> Strictly speaking. I'm not recording it. Yeah. I'm not recording it either. No, I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not recording this. I don't know I if that you. refers to media organizations. Yeah, I don't know what that means. You know what? You know what? This is what I'm going to do. The order is vague. So this there is you go. Anyway. Anyway. So you want the rest of it, you can catch it. Um, <laughs> that was Cash. I thought Cash did a phenomenal I thought he did a phenomenal job. I thought he did a phenomenal job. You see one Joe. It's just one Joe. Hat backward Joe is me. Okay? The other one, that's younger me. That's in the old, that's in the old days. I was not nearly as wise as I am now. I've learned a lot since then. I've learned a great deal. I've learned a great deal. It's the big uh, when you live in the big sky state, and have the big and have the fresh open atmosphere above you like that. You you you, you live and learn. <laughs> you live and learn. <laughs> you live and learn. All right. Well, anyway, tomorrow morning at ten a.m. the trial resumes right here on Good Logic. I will not be recording it. I will not be recording it. But right here in Good Logic. Broadcasting live from from Helena, Montana. Is it Helena or Helena? From Helen, Montana. My home. <laughs> Where you two, two, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know. I don't know that anyone's recording anything. I have a theory that there were Antifa plants in the crowd during one six, and there were violent actors of the Capitol. When the outcome of people on video is actually smashing doors, windows, and pushing in. Uh, you're not alone in this theory, Dapper Dave. Trust me. Trust me. Trust me. You're not alone in this theory. Some of them, I look, I think some of them got triggered into it. Probably a couple of them who are not Antifa. Next thing you know, you're under the Den you're under the Denver. God forbid. No, come on. That's not saying yeah, here we are watching it. It's miraculous. Life is miraculous. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's no Alexa command for this, but the following about. <laughs> oh, yeah, that would be great. Okay, Google, like this video. Okay, Google, subscribe. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> I love it. I gotta try that. That's great. That's for you're, you're a genius, Barracuda. You're a genius. Um, all right. Tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. Lady Logic wants to get some sleep. So I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this up here. Tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Eastern, which happens to be 8 a.m. Mountain time here in Montana <laughs> at 8 a.m. Eastern time, Montana, 9 a.m. Central and and Stone Throws Away Pacific time, 7 a.m. We will be <laughs> we will be resuming the trial. Day four of the trial should be fire. Should be fire. At least if you have some good commentary, which hopefully I'll do my best to provide. I'm gonna be landing my plane here now. So get prepared. Get prepared. Tell Alexa he, you can you can turn Alexa back on. I'm not gonna be a threat to your family. <laughs> and I will thank you all for joining me. I hope you please please like and subscribe and leave a comment. I noticed that like I'll get like forty thousand views and like and like seven comments. It makes me feel all alone. So if you could leave a comment, that'd be cool. That'd be nice. I will see you all tomorrow morning. Till then, take care of yourselves. And remember, be happy and eat the bugs. Godspeed. <laughs>